Committee has been impressed with your candor, your energy, and your understanding of the enormity of the task at hand. And, and we believe that you have made a good start. Now, whether anyone, including yourself, or the Red Cross can successfully reform the blood program is a question which is as yet, as yet unanswered. The FDA, which has done its job by identifying these serious and persistent problems, will also testify. The inspectional personnel of the Food and Drug Administration, such as Ms. Mary Cardin, have repeatedly ferreted out life-threatening and other problems despite the severe resource limitations under which all elements of FDA labor. And this is a major problem to which the committee will ultimately address its attention and which it will ultimately correct. The chair says to FDA and to Ms. Cardin that for these efforts they are to be commended. Now we will not say here that FDA is without fault. The September 1988 voluntary agreement between the Red Cross and <coughs> FDA was that agency's best judgment as to what was required to correct the problems at that time. It is now clear that the voluntary agreement may not have been fully complied with and may not be an adequate mechanism to assure us of the safety of the blood supply. And it now appears that the Food and Drug Administration will have to decide and promptly so, whether injunction, injunction or other formal, formal regulatory action is needed to protect the American public. Finally, the subcommittee intends to explore a number of issues with FDA to determine if regulatory or statutory changes are required to address problems that have been identified during the hearings and the investigation of the subcommittee. While the American people, I think, can take heart from the fact that the nation's blood supply is safer than it has ever been, I must point out that I still have doubts that it is safe as it should and can be. It is the goal of this subcommittee. I believe it is the goal of the Red Cross, and I'm satisfied that it is the drug of the Food and Drug Administration that we will move forward towards what will ultimately be the safest and the best blood supply for the people of this country. And I want it known that the inquiry of this subcommittee will not cease until that objective has been achieved. The chair recognizes now my good friend, the ranking minority member, uh, Mr. Bliley, for such opening statements he chooses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I commend you for calling this hearing to follow up on issues identified last summer in the subcommittee's first public hearing on the safety of the nation's blood supply. I understand that the American Red Cross has made a major structural change in response to problems highlighted at our hearing regarding a lack of central authority over blood services operations within the organization. The American Red Cross we saw last July consisted of 54 autonomous regions which not only did not work together but often seemed to be working at cross purposes. The operation we will see today is a much more centralized one with the 54 regional collection centers now answering to one central authority. Dr. McCullough, you represent that central authority. We have been impressed with your candor in your discussions with subcommittee staff, both majority and minority, and with the sincerity with which you are attempting to make the hard choices and improve the Red Cross blood services operations. At the same time, however, we need to make sure that the changes made and the changes anticipated are more than paper changes. As the FDA will make clear in our second panel today, there are still problems out there in the area of blood collection. Donor screening procedures are still not as effective as they should be. There remain gaps in the testing of donors and of the blood itself. There are still uh, that are still allowing an uh, unacceptably high rate or amount of blood that is positive for HIV, hepatitis, and other blood-borne diseases to enter the system. Dr. McCullough, I know you are trying to plug those gaps, and I look forward to hearing from you and from the FDA where that effort stands and what remains to be done. I would once again like to welcome uh, Ms. Mary Cardin to these proceedings. 
the problems you found at the Red Cross National Headquarters, on which you were questioned ex extensively by this subcommittee at our last hearing, have formed the basis for the structural changes now occurring within the Red Cross blood service operation. You are to be commended for your perseverance and for the quality of your work. It is my utmost hope that one result of this investigation will be a greater degree of communication among FDA inspectors, such as yourself, the various Red Cross collection facilities you inspect, and the national headquarters of both the Red Cross and the FDA. From what I have seen and from what I hope to hear today, we are well on our way to this goal, and in turn much further along the road to a safe blood supply in this country than we were nine months ago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Chair recognizes now the gentleman from Oregon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and let me commend you, Mr. Chairman, for continuing uh, this uh, important inquiry. The inquiry, of course, is a subject that's critical to all Americans, but it is especially relevant today to uh, citizens in the Pacific Northwest. Late yesterday, the Food and Drug Administration informed the Portland Red Cross that this blood center's license would be revoked unless, and I quote, immediate action was taken to address numerous problems found during a recent inspection. It appears on the basis of the records of the Portland Red Cross Center that the American Red Cross is not in compliance with its 1988 voluntary agreement with the FDA that required new safety measures to prevent the kind of problems found in Portland. I have obtained a copy of the FDA preliminary summary of their Portland inspection and it concerns me greatly. For example, the Portland report says that a number of discrepancies were found in the computer databases used for deferring blood donors whose blood was at high risk. Deferred blood must be handled especially sensitively because of the potential danger. As of March 1991, one review of these discrepancy reports identified, and I quote, approximately 350 possible discrepancies. The FDA concluded, and again I quote, our review of 20 of the discrepancies revealed that unsuitable blood products had been released from three donors. If unsuitable blood products had been released from three donors at the Portland Center out of a test involving just 20 discrepancies, Certainly, Northwest residents must be concerned about the possibility of other unsuitable blood products being released from the 330 other possible discrepancies. Several other sections of the FDA report specifically fur, refer, and I quote, to unsuitable blood products from multiple donors that were released by the Portland Blood Center. And paragraphs one and four of the report make clear that blood improperly or inadequately tested for AIDS and hepatitis B was released. In addition, the Portland Blood Center was required to file reports with the national authorities about blood products that were erroneously released. And again, as noted in the report, as of March 91, those reports were not submitted. What is especially significant about the Portland report is that it was compiled under the direction of the FDA's top inspector, Mary T. Carden. For an official of her stature to be part of a month-long investigation that has resulted in the FDA's concluding yesterday that they will revoke the Portland Center's license unless numerous deficiencies are corrected quickly is certainly evidence of serious problems. And certainly now Americans from other parts of the country want to know if the problems found in Portland are present in their areas. Blood safety questions are literally questions of life and death. Blood experts constantly stress that citizens face choices. Receiving blood products may be absolutely necessary to sustain life, and usually the prospects of acquiring a transmissible disease through those products is small. But this subcommittee believes that citizens facing those difficult choices have a right to know what government agencies are finding at blood centers across the nation. I share the view, as stated repeatedly by Chairman Dingell, that the nation's blood supply is safer than it's ever been. 
but it's part of our government responsibility to bring to light uh, reports of government agencies about programs on which the public relies. That's, in my view, the best way to prevent and correct the kinds of problems that were found in the report about Portland. Mr. Chairman, I thank you uh, for the opportunity. I want to commend uh, Mary Cardin and her associates uh, as well. Look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. The uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to extend my uh, uh, praise to you for calling this hearing. Certainly, all Americans are concerned about the quality and the safety of the blood supply. Many of us know personally individuals that have died because of AIDS, including a former colleague of ours, of course, uh, Stu McKinney. Uh, I might note that, as we heard from the, the Northwest, uh, Michigan, too, has had some problems with AIDS. Uh, we rank 17th in total cases of AIDS that have been reported in the country. Uh, as of March of 91, uh, we have re reported uh, 20. 2,120 cumulative cases of AIDS, and we've had about 1,300 AIDS deaths. Many of us, including myself, have donated blood. Many of us have also received it. And it is imperative that we have a fail-safe system in place to protect our nation's blood supply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also join with my colleagues here on the panel to commend you for this, this hearing, which I think is so very important. I do not believe that we can overstate the importance of a safe blood supply in our country. And I do not believe that the average citizen in our country realizes the role that the Red Cross has played over the years in assuring that we have that type of blood supply. I can recall when I was practicing medicine and emergency situations arose. I do not recall that there was ever a ch uh, uh, an occasion that I uh, called on the Red Cross for the blood that I needed that they did not supply that blood. And I was always very grateful for that, as was the patient uh, and their family. The decision as to whether or not to give blood is, is not one to be taken lightly. Uh, many people may feel that, well, we can get some blood and give it easily if uh, the necessity arises, but in many instances there are things that can be done other than giving blood, but the decision to give blood is one that uh, must be taken seriously. There are so many things that can happen from a pyrogenic reaction to an incompatible transfusion and all kinds of things in between that, the transfusion of infectious products, uh, but those are things that we have to guard against to be sure that uh, they do not happen. I believe that we have the technology to guard against that. And it's my belief that the errors, for the most part, that happen are human errors. They are errors that are based on the fact that individuals did not fulfill the responsibilities that they should have had in whatever step in that process uh, that they were involved in. So it seems to me that the responsibility is to ferret out those individuals, those people, uh, who are responsible for the mishaps uh, that occur. And I know that you're working on that. I know that you have applied a great deal of attention uh, to that. And I would say to those people in our country who are concerned about the blood supply that it is not safe, that they should listen to their individual physicians because they are the ones that should give them the kind of advice that they should have as to whether or not uh, blood should be taken. I can tell you that if I was in a life-threatening situation that I would not hesitate to take blood that had been, uh, had been administered uh, in the processing by the American Red Cross. Uh, I think that that is so very important that people understand that while we do have some problems and, and you will be addressing these problems and we would be looking at those problems, that they should look to their individual physicians about whether or not blood in a particular area is safe to take. Thank you all very much for being here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Uh, Lent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome our uh, witnesses this morning. This is a very important hearing. I uh, have no opening statement, but look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Um, Dr. McCullough, we're very happy you're here, and we thank you for your cooperation, your assistance with, and your assistance to the committee. We note you're accompanied by a very esteemed member of the bar. Uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, we are certainly delighted you're here this morning. 
I gather uh, from, from his presence to your left that he will be sitting there to advise you in, as, as, as counsel. Is that correct? That's correct. Very well. The record will so indicate uh, it is your right to be advised, be so advised if it, if it be your wish. Uh, to, your, to assist you and Mr. Fitzpatrick, there are copies of the rules of the subcommittee, the committee, and of the House there to advise you both of your rights and to, limit, uh, and, and to show you of the limits on the powers of the committee. The chair does advise that it is the practice that all witnesses who testify before the committee do testify under oath. Uh, the first question, doctor, is do you, do you have any objection to testifying under oath? No, I don't. Very well. Uh, doctor, if you uh, then have no objection to testifying under oath, if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide? Yes, I do. You are under oath. And the chair is happy to recognize you for such opening statements you choose to give. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the subcommittee. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to present to you a status report on our efforts to provide the American public with a safe and dependable blood supply. A blood supply which, uh, as has already been mentioned, is uh, um, thought to be by, by most uh, the safest in the world today. At the outset, I'd like to um, uh, insert a brief commentary uh, um, about uh, the recent FDA inspection in Portland uh, and then complete the rest of my remarks. The inspection in Portland disclosed very serious deficiencies. This result is not acceptable to me, and I'm taking actions to respond to it. However, uh, contrary to the implications of a press release, we have no indication that any patient has been put at risk or has received infected blood because of the practices there. We are making a very serious and I think effective effort to fundamentally change the American Red Cross Blood Service in the interest of providing the best possible assurances of blood safety. Probl the problems that do exist in Portland and elsewhere are being taken extremely seriously, and I hope that uh, you will uh, agree with that when I'm uh, finished with my remarks here. Uh, however, these situations uh, uh, have not uh, resulted in the uh, transfusion of infected blood to patients to the best of our knowledge. I'd like to continue with the rest of my uh, opening statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, largely as a result of this subcommittee's concerns last summer, the Red Cross has undergone an unprecedented self-examination in how it operates the blood service. The changes we've made and plan to make constitute the most far-reaching reforms of blood service in nearly 50 years. As you know, the American Red Cross collects and provides about half our nation's blood supply. Today, as on every other regular working day of the year, more than 20,000 people will donate blood to the American Red Cross. Uh, this will uh, occur and this will be collected by about 1,000 Red Cross nurses around the United States working in church basements, school gymnasiums, shopping centers, and more than 200 uh, locations throughout the United States. The Red Cross has been in the forefront of advancements and improvements to transfusion medicine during the 50-year history of our blood service. Since 1985, we have implemented five new infectious disease screening tests in the interest of making transfusion safer. This means that by between 1985 and 1990, the American Red Cross performed almost 100 million more infectious, infectious disease screening tests than were performed in the preceding five years. And this is illustrated, uh, Mr. Chairman, in the uh, chart on the left uh, on the wall over here, uh, the red shaded area indicating the uh, dramatic increase in the number of infectious disease screening tests carried out by the American Red Cross in the last half of the 1980s. I'd emphasize again, 100 million additional screening tests. Uh, and I will also point out that during that period of time, approximately 60 million units of blood products were prepared and provided to patients in this country. 
The 1980s were a time of unprecedented change in blood banking, change driven by many factors, among them the uh, advent in our society of the terrible scourge of AIDS. Public concern about AIDS and its effect on the safety of the blood supply has been expressed in many ways, including through the instrument of this committee. To meet this concern, the American Red Cross Blood Service must change its very structure in, uh, in order to meet the challenges of the 1990s and be prepared for the next century. Thus, with the full endorsement and approval of the highest levels of management and governance within the Red Cross, we're making major changes that fundamentally alter how blood banking is done within the Red Cross. I can assure you that I have had the strong and unwavering support of the Board of Governors and its Chairman, Mr. Moody, and our new President, Elizabeth Dole. The subcommittee asked me to answer a series of questions, and I've responded to those questions in writing, but I'd like to highlight just a few of the particular changes that I think have the greatest effect on quality and safety and the regulatory compliance of the Red Cross. First of all, in August of 1990, the Board of Governors of the American Red Cross passed a landmark resolution centralizing Red Cross blood services and vesting full accountability and authority at national headquarters through the Senior Vice President for Biomedical Research, in other words, me. The resolution also created the position of principal officer in each of our 53 regions and made each of them accountable to the Senior Vice President. Though uh, through this major structural change, created by the resolution, these principal officers now have the full authority over all of the resources, that is, people, funds, facilities, and materials used to operate the blood service. This change was revolutionary for the American Red Cross. For nearly half a century, as has been pointed out, the Red Cross blood regions, although operating within the framework of FDA License 190, uh, have experienced uh, varying degrees of local autonomy and authority. Our new framework enables more standardization, rapid decision making, more responsiveness, and the adoption of a new organizational philosophy. Along with this new organizational structure, we're moving aggressively to standardize, streamline, and update our procedures. Our goal is to have all of our basic procedures revised and updated by year end, and we're on target to achieve that. Our revisions are intended, among other things, to reduce the possibility for different local interpretations of the procedures. Our aim is that each procedure will be done the same way every day and in every Red Cross location. Another of the first steps I took at National Headquarters was to establish a new department for training, education, and recruitment so that we could meet the need for standardized, comprehensive training of blood services personnel. I'm also making major changes in our quality assurance and regulatory affairs area. Each of our regions now has a compliance officer, but in order to provide these internal uh, inspection uh, officers with greater independence, they're now completely separate organizationally from any of the operating departments of the blood service, and they report directly to top management in each of our blood regions. Thus, I believe that we are toughening our internal monitoring systems we're organizing to provide a more effective internal watchdog system, and we're demanding quality performance. Because Red Cross Blood Service is a system of 53 regions, we must take advantage of our networking capabilities. Therefore, we're implementing several other uh, quality improvement changes. First of all, we're now disseminating to all of our regions the results of an FDA inspection in each region. In that way, everyone has the opportunity to see the observations and introduce appropriate uh, procedural changes. Secondly, we're now conferring monthly by video conference with all 53 regions regarding uh, major quality, compliance, or regulatory matters. Third, we're now developing a computerized inspection analysis system, which will allow us to analyze individual FDA observations, as well as look for trends or patterns in inspection findings. Finally, I have instructed the heads of each of our uh, regional centers to meet directly with the FDA district director following each inspection so that a clear, frank discussion of the situation can be held and we can set about meeting the ex FDA's expectations in a very direct and efficient manner. I believe the combination of these activities will allow us to identify more quickly problems related to quality or compliance and to implement appropriate changes throughout the entire Red Cross system. 
Next, I'd like to discuss the donor deferral registry. It's been mentioned already as a, as a source of some FDA observations. This is a computerized system which contains the coded identity of individuals whose blood is not suitable by FDA regulation for transfusion. Unfortunately, that donor deferral registry is now the source of some of our problems, as you've heard, because it's being asked to do things for which it was not designed. Therefore, the American Red Cross is developing a new state-of-the-art donor deferral registry. As part of this development, we will investigate the possibility of using the donor deferral registry to screen donors at the donor site before they donate blood as a mechanism of keeping potentially infectious blood completely out of the system. All of these actions, Mr. Chairman, have addressed very decisively and we think aggressively issues contained in the Voluntary Agreement of 1988 and this committee's questions uh, regarding compliance issues. I'm using that Voluntary Agreement as a blueprint for the actions that I'm taking. And I can say that today the Red Cross is operating in the spirit of the Voluntary Agreement. I expect when these changes are implemented that we will be operating in compliance with the letter of that agreement. I recently provided a detailed update uh, on the progress of the, in this area to FDA Commissioner Kessler, and that statement has been provided uh, in written testimony to this subcommittee. And Mr. Chairman, up to this point, I've addressed regulatory and compliance and organizational issues, all of which I know have caused your committee considerable concern. We believe today's blood is safer than ever before, and uh, I've tried to uh, uh, provide some of the reasons why. Um, but also, you can see uh, on the other chart uh, on the wall, the, the right-hand chart over there, uh, the dramatic decline in the uh, proportion of potentially infectious donors uh, in the blood supply during the latter part of the 1980s as each of these new infectious disease screening tests was introduced. The introduction of each test is shown by an arrow on the baseline of the graph over there, and the bars indicate the proportion of uh, uh, the estimated proportion of inf infectious donors in the blood supply. So, uh, one of the questions that uh, uh, you posed, uh, Mr. Chairman, is a bottom line question. Um, if you're receiving Red Cross blood, can you feel confident about the quality and the safety of that blood? And despite uh, uh, the comments that uh, have already been made, uh, I believe the answer to that is yes, you can. Now, I base this judgment on the remarkable decline in infectious donors in the blood system that has been achieved over the last five years. Uh, and another very, uh, one very dramatic example of this uh, progress is the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. Although AIDS and HIV infection receives much of the attention in recent years, the fact is that hepatitis is the most common transfusion transmitted disease. With the implementation of the hepatitis C screening test, we've now eliminated two-thirds of this greatest infectious disease risk associated with a blood transfusion. There are several new testing procedures we're making plans to implement, and I'd be glad to elaborate on those if you wish during the question session. Let me now uh, close with a very uh, serious message. I'm proud of American Red Cross Blood Services and the contributions that we make every day to the health of the American public. I'm proud of the changes that we've made since last August. Significant progress has been made in centralizing and standardizing our blood program. We do have the ability to act more aggressively and forthrightly as problems in our regional centers are identified. For instance, I've suspended laboratory testing operations in three different regions since I arrived here last fall. I've suspended virtually all of the operations in another region. In one region, I discharged uh, two senior employees. I'm convinced that the changes that we're making, although they are not a quick fix, are beginning to have effect. Unlike the Red Cross blood services you may have perceived nine months ago, the Red Cross I describe to you today is making changes that are dramatic and unprecedented for our organization. In February, our new president, Elizabeth Dole, arrived and pressed the organization and me even further, insisting that we accelerate the pace and the scope of our reforms. I agree, Mr. Chairman, and I want to, do, I want to be absolutely clear on this. We must do more. I'm not complacent, and I'm not satisfied. 
major additional initiatives and actions will be necessary before the American Red Cross Blood Service is the kind of operation you want and I want and the public expects. Let me repeat, Mr. Chairman, I am not satisfied. I am, we've not done enough and I'm not finished. Mrs. Dole and I will be discussing with the American Red Cross Board of Governors plans for a major overhaul of all 53 of our blood region, uh, regional centers. Pending approval by our Board of Governors and a close look at the significant resources that we will need to accomplish a system-wide rejuvenation, we will announce uh, the specifics of our plan in the coming months. However, this is not simply an American Red Cross issue, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Dole uh, believes it is a public policy issue and should be elevated to that level. And I concur. We'll need the active participation of our government to help define the blueprint of a stronger, more effective system. Finally, I want to thank you once again, Mr. Chairman, for the leadership you and the subcommittee have brought to this nation in the safety of its blood supply. Given the compelling, compelling public interest in blood, the outstanding human and material resources uh, within the Red Cross, and our recognition of our duty to serve the community, we simply cannot and must not fail. This concludes my oral remarks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Doctor, the uh, committee thanks you for your very helpful statement, and we want you to know that we're, we are appreciative of your kindness in being here. We would also like you to know that, that uh, we do appreciate the leadership that you and Mrs. Dole have been showing in addressing the concerns that the committee found last year uh, as we went into these questions. We know that there was some distress on the part of the Red, Red Cross that we held the hearings to address the facts as we found them first and then to have the Red Cross before us to address matters later. It is the practice of the committee, however, to proceed that way, and we believe that it is the fairest way to do because it lays out the questions and then permits the individual or organization which is involved in the questions to then come forward at appropriate time to respond. We hope that you recognize that this has been an attempt to follow not only an established procedure, but one which it is our view is, is, is the fairest way to proceed in addressing these matters, especially given the large number of inquiries into which the committee is engaged in, in, at any particular time. So the Chair will now recognize members for questions, commencing first with the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden, and then we will proceed through other members in the orders of their appearance. From thank you very from much. Um, Oregon's recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McCulloch, let me ask you some questions, if I might, about the FDA uh, report uh, in Portland. The FDA uh, report says in several sections that unsuitable blood products were released in Portland. That's in item 37 in the report. It's in item 38. Um, it's in a, a number of uh, of, uh, of areas. Could you tell us what is an unsuitable uh, blood product and what does it mean that that blood product has been released? But it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's an excellent uh, uh, point, Congressman Wyden, in that uh, the definition of an unsuitable blood product is extremely broad and it might, essentially, I would interpret it to mean any product that was not treated in exact accordance with predefined operating procedures. So that this could range from something that would be extremely dangerous, a clearly a, blood, a unit of blood that was infectious uh, for AIDS or hepatitis, to a unit of blood that really wouldn't pose any danger to someone who might receive it, but was not handled or treated exactly in accordance with operating procedures. So uh, it is a bit difficult to lump all these things together, but that is the, the procedure that's used. And, 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 what I, and what does it mean that it's been released? I mean, in, in item 37 and 38, it says in Oregon, unsuitable blood products were released. Um, that also is a, a term that means different things to different people. In the technical jargon, I believe, of the FDA and us blood bankers, uh, release is uh, uh, the point at which the testing and all the procedures are completed and the, within the blood center, the unit of blood is now considered available for use. 
to most of us in the general public, release means that you sent it out and gave it to somebody. But technically, a unit could be released in the FDA terminology and still be in, right in the building under the control of all the, uh, uh, of the blood center. And that is what happened with some of those particular units. Well, do you think that this is a serious matter that the FDA has found uh, in 37 and 38 where it says unsuitable blood products uh, were released? Uh, let me say, Congressman, I think uh, the inspection in the Portland facility is a very serious matter. And please understand, if I'm, try if I'm explaining anything here, let me make a, a sort of general qualifier that I don't mean to minimize any of these, uh, of the importance of any of these. Um, in, particularly in items 36 and 37. Th 30, uh, 37 and 38, sir, do talk about unsuitable products being, being released. And I, th I think that's the kind of thing citizens would like to, like to understand the implications okay. of. Um, let me take them one at a time because they're slightly different. On 37, um, a, an individual uh, may answer, I should really talk about that particular one, the, the, an individual may answer a donor history question such as, have they ever uh, experimented with intravenous drugs? Or a woman may answer whether she's ever had uh, sex with a bisexual male. And those would be reasons for disqualifying a person. And that information goes into the donor referral registry. Those questions are asked each time someone comes back. And we do find that sometimes people come back and they don't give us that history. Either they've forgotten or they may be uh, 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 not truthful. Uh, the donor me, deferral let registry. Let me ask you this because my, my time's expired. Okay. Are unsuitable products supposed to be released? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But it, but it says here on this FDA form that they were released. Yes. And you do think that that is an extremely serious matter? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Time of the gentleman has expired. New York, Mr. Blatt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Uh, McCullough, in the last couple of years, two Red Cross blood collection centers, one in Washington, D.C. and Albany, New York, have been shut down because of serious problems. I understand that the Charleston, South Carolina facility may soon close, at least temporarily. Can you say with absolute certainty that in the next year, Another inspection report like the one in Portland will not be issued? Uh, no, sir, I can't. The, uh, the changes in the complexity of blood banking over the last five years, illustrated in the uh, charts over here, have, uh, uh, we think, on the one hand, greatly improved the safety of the blood supply. They have also added enormous amounts of uh, additional technical systems and procedures, millions of steps that create the possibility for error despite the improvement in the safety of the blood supply. Uh, frankly, the Red Cross and I believe most blood banks uh, uh, do not have systems which have kept pace with this. And uh, when inspections are carried out, uh, the FDA quite rightly and quite effectively identifies the places in which these systems need to be improved. Now, uh, looking at the chart on the right-hand side in estimates of infectious donors per 100,000 donors, uh, we see there's a remarkable drop-off in the estimated number of uh, infectious donors between 1980 and 1990. Uh, can you tell us, uh, to, other, th other than uh, improvements in your system, to what we may attribute this drop off? And the, I would attribute it to the introduction of additional tests. The introduction of the test for the HIV virus, for the hepatitis C virus, for, uh, for the HTLV1 virus that causes leukemia. All of these tests have been introduced since 1985. And uh, all of the blood that is taken at a Red Cross Center, for example, is routinely tested? Yes, with every one of these tests. And back in 1980 and 81, when you had the uh, much higher rate of infectious donors, you, you, uh, you believe that blood was infected with one of these uh, 
The blood taken during that period may have been infected with one of these uh, substances? Or yeah, yes. In the, many of these tests, uh, some of these viruses were not even known at the time, uh, and therefore the tests weren't available. Well, these, these are all so, based on estimates, is that right? Well, th this is, uh, uh, yes, although this is compiled from data taken from the medical uh, literature, uh, research reports published in the medical literature, which uh, survey large numbers of uh, uh, either patients or normal individuals to define the prevalence of these viruses in the population. So that during the years 1980 through 1984, it was all exactly the same? The same uh, number of infectious donors per 100,000 was 1,100? Well, it would, be, it would be difficult to have an exact number for every year because ordinarily these studies would be done maybe uh, in, a, in a community over a period of a year and the data would be accumulated and you don't do a study like that every year. So um, we've taken uh, data and, uh, and extrapolated until the time of the next study, assuming there was not much change, if nothing else was done, in, you know, to alter the testing. Okay. Now, I understand that the Red Cross sent out their own inspection team to audit the Portland Center just two weeks before Ms. Cardin and the FDA arrived, and essentially uh, that the Red Cross inspection team gave the Portland site a clean bill of health. Is that correct? Uh, no, sir, it's not. In, Did, uh, there was a Red Cross inspection team that got, that, that reviewed this uh, or audited this Portland Center before Mrs. Carden. Yes, that's correct. And that inspection took place approximately two weeks before Mrs. Carden. Yes, sir. What did it find? Uh, the, uh, uh, it alerted me that uh, the general procedures uh, 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 were such that we should move uh, to update and revise those procedures. And it's, it really indicated a pattern uh, that is exactly what I am putting a great deal of emphasis on with revising and updating procedures that will affect all of our centers. Our inspection is done a bit differently than the FDA in that we look at broad procedures and they look at individual transactions. Okay, I, I see my time is up. Uh, I, I did. Uh, sure, I just wanted to ask one, one final question. Did you, in that inspection that took place two weeks or so before Mrs. Cardin and the FDA inspected, did, you didn't give it a clean bill of health, but did you find the same problems as the FDA found when it made the inspection two weeks later? Or was it I, something altogether different? No, I would say generically we identified the same kinds of problems, although we look at process and they look at individual transactions. I don't know if this makes sense, but we look at whether the procedures seem to be adequate, whether they're being followed correctly, the FDA looks at a particular laboratory test on a particular unit of blood to determine whether that was done correctly. And we come to the same conclusion. Okay, I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to yield. Um, be out of time. Doctor, the, your, your inspection team was out there at Portland for how long? I can't say for sure. Ordinarily, our inspections involve about three days, and I would assume that was a standard one. But I can check on it to be sure. No, that, that's that's. I think that's good enough for our purposes. Uh, I'm informed it was two or three days, but the FDA's inspection team was out there for four weeks. So obviously, there 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 was a much more intense uh, uh, focus by FDA than 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 you had given. Um, Chair, the time the gentleman from New York has, has expired. The chair is going to recognize now the uh, gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. McCullough, would you tell me what you believe to be the reliability of the screening tests that are used to detect the presence of infectious agents in blood to be? Well, Congressman. Such as HIV and hepatitis. Um, as uh, you know, Congressman, each specific test has a, a somewhat different level of sensitivity and effectiveness, but um, uh, 
it's difficult to give you exact numbers off the top of my head. Let me say that the test for HIV is extremely sensitive and uh, uh, extremely specific, something like 99%. Uh, the test for hepatitis C and hepatitis B are in that range, but I think not quite as sensitive and specific. Uh, but I think on balance, the, these tests are extremely effective tests as medical laboratory tests go. I'd be glad to provide the committee with very specific uh, um, figures on I this point. I think that would be like. worthwhile for us to have that uh, information, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me go back to uh, the donor deferral register that you were talking about uh, earlier that, that is used to keep infected blood uh, out of the system and you stated that it was called on to do something that it was not designed to do. Would you elaborate on that uh, for us and tell us whether or not uh, that is responsible for some of the problems that we are encountering at this point? Uh, Congressman, I think it is, exactly is. Um, what I mean by that is uh, the Red Cross Donor Deferral Registry was initiated in 1972 by one of my predecessors, uh, Tibber Greenwald, who's now a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, at that time, it was initiated strictly uh, to identify uh, donors who were found to test positive for hepatitis B. Uh, it was a very simple, uh, straightforward issue. Either you're positive or you're not positive, and you go in the registry if you are, and you're permanently deferred from donating blood. We now have seven different infectious disease screening tests, uh, but it's not even a matter of, of multiplying this times seven, because there are many other conditions now for which a donor may be only temporarily deferred, not permanently deferred, or a donor may be uh, uh, allowed to donate blood and have an abnormal test result but not permanently deferred, and we need a way to keep track of the fact that they had that test result, that abnormal result, and if they have a second one, then they're permanently deferred. So the complexities of this thing have just increased enormously, but the computer systems and the software have not been fundamentally redone since the beginning. I mean, they've been tampered with and adjusted and things, but we need, so my decision has been, we're gonna scrap that registry entirely. And I have a working group now working to develop a brand new state-of-the-art registry. So this would be one of the very significant steps that could be, be taken to update your technology and software and computers to deal uh, with finding out who those people are that should be deferred from giving uh, blood and that uh, in instances where necessary be permanently deferred from giving blood. Is that? Uh, That's exactly that right. Could you give in me it? some idea or do you have any idea about what percentage of the problems that we've encountered may be related to that particular system? Um, as I, my recollection is, uh, I think of it in another way, I believe about 20 percent of our FDA citations deal with the donor deferral registry which is one of the reasons I've targeted that as a major effort for us to scrap the present system and get a new one. I see that my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, mm -hmm. chair, will, chair will recognize the gentleman just for, the gentleman desires the chair will recognize him to persist just briefly more if he wishes. Chair, yeah. chair, chair, chair notes the gentleman's on a chain of questions and the chair will be happy to let the gentleman proceed a bit further if he wishes. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to, to try to focus on uh, this, um, this register that was, had been used and how it had not been used as it was intended to be used and the problem that uh, it, uh, it had caused. And uh, Dr. McCullough has answered that question. So I'm at the, I have come, thank you very much, but I've come to the end of that chain of questions. Thank you. Very well. Chair, thanks, Mr. Chairman. The uh, chair recognizes now the gentleman from uh, Minnesota, Mr. Sikorsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. McCullough, uh, as, a, as a fellow Minnesotan and uh, someone whose leadership in the medical uh, and health communities in Minnesota is, is been, uh, uh, has been great and will continue to be great and, and who's received a bunch of accolades that, uh, uh, that are deserved, uh, um, you're, I think, the right person in the right place at the right time. Um, 
That's the first shoe. The second shoe is, uh, uh, I know your testimony talks a little bit, but I'd ask you for the record to respond to a couple questions about, first, the strengths and weaknesses of the current system, and secondly, about what you see for the future. And I know you have some thoughts about artificial intelligence being involved in the process of selection and the rest of it. Kind of the, take us into the future um, and, uh, and, and, and submit that for the record so the, the, the record has that and we have the benefit of that. Will you do that? Yes. The, 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 uh, has this letter been made? No, not okay. yet. The, uh, I, I'd like oh. to... Uh, oh. Uh, share uh, Congressman Wyden's concern uh, uh, because it, uh, it's his region or some other region this this kind of thing happens and you, you're responsible to uh, to raise these uh, these issues he received a letter um, and maybe you can get a if you have a copy uh, we can get you one uh, from uh, the director of the Red Cross uh, blood services in the Pacific Northwest region let me quote from him. Mary Carden, <clears throat> the FDA inspector, left a rather long list of procedure recommendations that require significant expansion of our manufacturing documentation. The uh, director writes, this will take some time to implement particularly the retraining of staff. The inspection did not lead to the discovery of the release of either proven or probably infected blood products. Uh, end of quotation. Uh, you've read the 483 inspection report. Uh, uh, we've, we've all heard about it this morning. Uh, are the views expressed in the letter by this director of that uh, blood bank uh, uh, ex particularly the, quote, the inspection did not lead to the discovery or of the release of either proven or probably infected uh, uh, blood products. Uh, is that accurate? My view of, uh, of the situation in Portland is that while these observations are not acceptable and they are serious and important, we have not any evidence to this point that any patient received a transfusion of infectious blood or that any patient was injured by these, uh, by these steps. No, uh, wait a minute, wait a I minute, know. I, you know, come on, Le, uh, you know the, the question is, is this statement, the inspection did not lead, the inspection, FDA, did not lead to the discovery of the release of either proven or probably mm -hmm. infected blood products, is that statement accurate? The public, the inspection I mean, I did not lead to the discovery of the release of probably infect, infected blood products. The reason I'm uh, hesitating a little bit is uh, um, uh, that I, uh, I reviewed this uh, letter briefly and uh, um, before it uh, was sent and had asked that it not be sent. Uh, uh, because, because you were uncomfortable with this language? Yeah, and it's, it's not that I'm trying to recant on any view here. I don't believe that any patients were injured, and I don't believe that anyone received a transfusion of infectious blood. That's not what he but said, that's though. That's not what he's saying here, and it gets into the word release. Uh, you, uh, back to my earlier comments that well, one can release a so I'm concerned about this, too. I think you have testified that release did occur under the term of the, the technical definition that you and the head of this blood bank would right. use. That's right. And in fact, this blood was this infected. I think uh, we have no evidence that it was infected, but uh, I would How guess about that Dr. Probably. Yeah, I would guess that Dr. Patum is using the word release here in the general sense, not but he's the... But he's not able to right. do that when he's writing from, a, as a technical, as the director of this blood bank, to a member of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee in the context of an O&I investigation. He can't jump to the, the generic or the, uh, 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 the general. He, he's using it, and, and he's wrong. It was released. 
the units of blood referred to in the report are, uh, it's actually absolutely correct that the units of blood referred to uh, were handled in the way that's described in the report and uh, were released according to that technical term, yes? Well, uh, thank you. And I, and I, I, if this were in Minnesota, Minnesotans weren't, and I don't think Oregonians can be comfortable with the difference the semantic differences and the probability uh, 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 issues here. In fact, they should not be comfortable with accepting this statement uh, by this uh, director. Sure. Dr. McCullough, I'm, I'm puzzled. If you told the head of the Portland uh, Blood Bank not to send this statement out, you must have been uncomfortable you know, with the statement. And it seems to me what I've, I've picked up is that you're really not sure. You really can't confirm whether or not any of this uh, infected blood has been released. Isn't that correct? Uh, no, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go to that conclusion. Uh, first of all, I didn't talk to him directly. I told the people in my office that I would prefer that this letter not be sent. At that time, I, did, I didn't have very much information about the specific citations in the inspection form and was not comfortable with the kind of statement that would seem to uh, uh, indicate a lack of a problem until I could inform myself in considerable detail about what had happened. Um, as I've acquired that information, uh, I really do conclude that while these are important errors and they're not, this, this is not the kind of operation that I expect the Red Cross to have in the future, uh, that the testing, uh, as we put the test results together, that the testing indicates that these were not infectious units of blood and nobody got them. But your, uh, Congressman Sikorsky is, actually, is exactly right. The technical term release, as it's used in these inspections, did occur. It's a, it's a different issue from whether it went off to, uh, uh, to another community or another hospital. This, this troubles me. You said that there's no evidence that any patient was put at risk. Uh, I'm willing to concede that, but is there evidence that no patient was put at risk? You understand the difference in the question? Um, help you me, say sir. no evidence that any patient was put at risk. Now that is comforting, okay. but it is not a complete review of the situation which is going to lay, let everybody all of a sudden be comfortable. Can you make here the statement that there is evidence that no patient was put at risk? Can you make that statement? I think, uh, hmm. I think I can based on the testing which, which suggests that none of these units were actually infectious, but I can't tell you that I'm very what comfortable testing, with that. What testing was performed that showed that none of these units uh, were infected? Well, in the first three instances, it appears when you look at the aggregate of data that the testing was completed uh, and that these were improper uh, recording of unit numbers and, and records. Can you, can you make the bold statement that the testing was done? Not correctly, no. You, can, you cannot make that statement. No, sir. You infer from something that, that the testing might have been done. I, I, and you say that because the recording system did not in fact work, that we then have evidence that, that, that the testing might have been done. Is that what you're telling us? You cannot make the bald statement that the testing was done. You can say that the recording system was not correct. Yes. So that then leads us to, to question the entire validity of the recording system. Is that right? Yes. Now, we, Doctor, this is, this, this is a friendly panel, even though I, I suspect you're probably not enjoying the questions. <laughs> uh, 
but it is one where, where we are trying to see to it that we, that, that we get the answers that, that plague us, and that is whether or not this system is assuring us to the fullest degree, in fact, that it's working. And I am left with the unfortunate conclusion that we have here a testing system which has not been applied to assure us that no patient is put at risk. I assume that that's an important goal. In other words, the purpose of the, of the testing system is to give us the highest degree of certainty that we can get that the blood that flows through this system is in fact safe. Is that a correct statement yes. or not? Yes. I okay. think that so we, having, having established that, we are then driven to the conclusion that the testing system here is not producing the desired result. Is that correct? I, I would say the testing system is not uh, being carried out with the degree of tightness and the demand for meticulous attention that I expect this system to have. And, and, and I applaud that statement, and I apologize to the gentleman for intruding. Chair is going to uh, chair is going to recognize the gentleman for a couple more questions because I've intruded on his I'm time. I'm going to I'm going to just uh, conclude by. Uh, by saying, I think you, uh, in baseball terms, are a great manager, not a good manager, a great manager. I think one of your starting, uh, some of your starting uh, players need to be uh, trained uh, and uh, worked out. Uh, uh, you seem to be getting the support up above and, and cleaning things up and tightening things up, but you need, uh, need to get it uh, across the country. The, there's an old hackneyed uh, saying, uh, you know, before the uh, transplants and all that, the, the miracle of uh, blood transfusions is, you know, swept ac uh, across the, the medical profession and across the uh, country. Um, and it was said repeatedly, blood is the gift of life. It's still, uh, it still is an accurate, although maybe hackneyed uh, uh, saying. And so the adequacy of the FDA's uh, uh, regulation and inspection, the effectiveness of you, the biggest blood service organization uh, in the country, if not the world, and the, uh, the safety of the blood supply generally are issues that are just very dear. In it. And, um, and, I, and I know you strive for perfection, but that's really what people are. The blood supply has to be safe, and, and that's why we're here. And we know you, sh you share in that, uh, that commitment. Yes, I do. Um, are resources available to fulfill that commitment? Uh, they have been so far. I, I have been uh, very, very pleased that uh, I have been uh, urged and specifically instructed by Mrs. Dole and Mr. Moody uh, to identify any and all steps that I think uh, are indicated, and uh, their task is to set about providing the resources for me to carry that out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Chair recognizes now a gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Dr. McCullough, recently I visited the Cleveland chapter about uh, two weeks ago. Met with a very number, a number of, of very dedicated individuals, men and women, who I think seriously interested in, in assuring the quality of, of the product and uh, ensuring the continued good reputation of the Red Cross. Uh, the Red Cross is indeed burdened. You are expected to be there whenever the, the phone rings and to fulfill a variety of, of tremendous needs uh, uh, and pressures uh, on fulfilling those demands. While I was there, I saw some of the barcoding machines uh, in, in their blood handling uh, uh, process, and I understand that that is your technological way of, of, of keeping track of, of the appropriate samples and matching the tests with the samples and ensuring that uh, uh, the product is, is, is safe uh, at the end. And I understand that these, uh, are, are, do I understand correctly that these barcoding machines are required as part of the FDA Red Cross agreement? Uh, it's not stipulated in the agreement per se, but it is <clears throat> a substantial parts of the agreement deal with our computer systems and the requirements uh, for, this, for various parts of the computer systems. It's almost inconceivable that a blood bank uh, of any size today could function without this. How many blood banks, in fact, have uh, adequate numbers of appropriate bar barcoding machines, and how many do not? Hmm. Uh, gosh, that's a difficult question to answer off the top of my head, Congressman, uh, because some of our centers and uh, 
uh, other non-Red Cross uh, blood banks, some of them are relatively small, collecting maybe 10 or 15,000 units of blood a year, which you could handle in a manual fashion. But when you get to a size of collecting 40 or 50,000 units of blood a year or 400,000, as some of our centers do, with millions of pieces of data, you just have to have this kind of system or you can't handle the data. The errors would be enormous even compared to what we're talking about today. Dr. McCullough, that, uh, that gets me precisely to, to the point uh, where I wanted to go. The, uh, the ability to affect anything in society today without assistance of new technologies is, is so severely limited uh, that we have to implement the, the new technologies. And while we can talk about human failures, uh, I understand that programming and technology, uh, the product is only as good as what, what you and I people put into it. Uh, FDA inspections, uh, uh, up to and including the Portland one, have found uh, some problems in the Red Cross's uh, computerized donor deferral software. Now that's the that's the sieve, that's that's the the gate through which we either will or will not catch uh, those kinds of of donations that may be deleterious if if released to the to the community. The, uh, one of the issues in the, uh, in the voluntary agreement was the establishment of a computerized donor uh, deferral software system. How long will, and in your testimony you referred to a new one being in place, how long will it take before your new donor deferral system will be developed and it will be implemented uh, at your large collection sites? Well, we project the new uh, state-of-the-art registry will be in operation in 18 months. So that means that throughout the next 18 months at least, we will have to uh, get by on the existing system in the 50-some 50, 50 regions that exist. Of these 50-some systems that we're then going to use current technology, how many of these regions have had their current systems validated? Well, uh, we are, um, we're in the, we have just revised all of our operating procedures related to donor deferral registries and uh, uh, actually it's in the stack of, I brought along the newly uh, developed uh, procedures here that have been released in the last few weeks. Uh, we are also, uh, what we do is look for any problems that we identify and, and try to repair the software that deals with those particular problems. And so it will be a maintenance mode for the next 18 months, fixing problems that we see as they arise uh, while we put the effort to develop the new registry. Um, if, if I might make one other comment that well, the... I'd like to know that, I mean, you, you, you set up standards, <laughs> you're trying now to meet those standards, but I'd like to know before we even make the leap to what the new technology will be 18 months from now, how many current systems are certified and validated as meeting the standards as they currently exist? Uh, we're in the process of converting all of our computer systems to a, a handful of consortia and uh, the projected uh, time for conversion of all those systems would be uh, between June and September of this year. If uh, Maybe this gets at the point you're raising. What but have, are any of them validated or certified yes, today? Yes, uh, the system based in Detroit is validated and certified now, and that covers 21, I think, of our regional centers, which account for, uh, I think, uh, somewhat about two and a half million units of the, of the blood that we collect. And how many are in the final certification process? I'm sorry, sir. I've How many are in the final certification process? Uh, two others. Philadelphia, which uh, will involve 11 centers and about 2 million units of blood, and another system developed by Abbott Laboratories, which will involve about 1 million units of blood. So uh, we expect uh, by somewhere between July and September <clears throat> to have reduced the number of different computer systems within the Red Cross down to uh, these five consortia and a couple of other independent operations. The five consortia will involve um, uh, 45, I think it is, of, of our, uh, or 47 of our 53 regions and about 80 percent of the total blood supply then using one of five basic computer systems, which may seem like a lot of variation, but considering that we've had 53 regions, uh, uh, many of whom had, almost all of whom had their own little variation of a computer system, it's one step to try to 
minimize the number of different ways things are done. One, if I might say one other thing, that uh, uh, since I did come to National Headquarters, uh, we have updated the donor deferral registry program on two different occasions. And so we are continuing to, you know, to try to fix the things as we identify them. But the basic solution is we need a state-of-the-art system. Pardon me if I express my frustration. And it is not cynical in nature. But in 1988, the Red Cross and the FDA signed a voluntary agreement, one of the pieces of which was to create an appropriate, technologically driven deferral donor system. You now tell me that since that agreement was made, and I realize that that predated you and you are here to fix problems and not to necessarily wear the jacket for the problems that preceded you, but nonetheless, from 1988 through September of 1991, you may get all of the bugs and the current system worked out. But then 13 months after that, you're going to put a new system in. There's not a consumer in America who doesn't or has not experienced the problem of what happens when you buy something new. What's that curve going to look like if you get performance up to your optimal standards in September of 91, which were part of the 88 agreement, and then institute a new system and have to go through the whole plethora of problems that will exist in introducing something that will even be more technologically driven than the current system, which you clearly have not been able to put in the field in an efficacious way to date. You understand my question, Doctor? Yes, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> uh, while I, I can't, uh, of course, uh, e exactly uh, promise the future, <clears throat> and I'm uh, uh, in a, uh, I'm not able to uh, atone for the sins of the past. Uh, uh, I, I really believe that the donor registry system that will be brought up in, in 18 months uh, is not going to be filled with bugs and will be, will be an effective, a great leap forward from the system that will be in place at the time. To you, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Other countries have based whole economic plans on uh, great sorry about leaps that. forward yes. and uh, <laughs> um, they somehow don't make it. Yeah. What, I mean, there are several things that will be um, uh, central to the new system that I think will simplify uh, things a great deal. First of all, it'll be a uh, uniform national system. One of the things that leads to a, a lot of our problems right now is that each uh, individual region has considerable latitude in what they put into this registry and how they use it. And so there'll be one way to operate, one registry for every blood center in the Red Cross and therefore half the nation's blood supply. Dr. McCullough, we want the system to work and we want you to have the resources that you've testified that and support uh, uh, that you're getting. So. Please understand the, the nature of, uh, of, of our questions. I know there's a lot of suspicion when we say, hi, we're from Washington and we want to help you. Um, but in this set of circumstances, uh, I'm from Cleveland and we want to help you too. We appreciate it. Time the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. McCullough, it is my understanding that a test for HIV-2 is now in existence and is being used in a number of European countries. However, very few U.S. blood banks have adopted it, and the FDA has not made it mandatory. Is this correct? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and I also understand that a combined test to detect antibodies for HIV-1 and 2 is available. Is that correct? Uh, that is under uh, uh, review by the FDA for licensure. It's uh, my belief the test that's available now is a freestanding HIV-2 only test, and we're waiting for licensure of the combination test. Well, would the Red Cross be willing and able to do either the HIV-2 test or the combined test if it uh, were allowed to do so? Uh, absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have made the decision to, uh, be, to initiate HIV-2 testing, and the approach that I'm taking to do this is uh, we are uh, developing uh, what's called an IND, or Investigational New Drug Application, even though this is a test, not a drug, one follows the same procedure, for submission to the FDA to request permission to begin to use the combination test 
in an experimental manner even before it's licensed because we can't predict when they will license it. And the reason I'm taking that approach rather than starting to use the freestanding test that's already licensed, which I could just begin, is that the use of this combination test is the, is the direction we want to go in the long run. And if I have to go through all of the time and uh, divert the resources to set up a freestanding test that I only use for a few months and then switch to a different one, I really have wasted a lot of energy that could be put to more useful things. So we'll move ahead to set up the test we ultimately expect to use. If it's not licensed when we're ready to do that, we'll have this IND into the FDA, which we hope they would approve. Well, for my own um, knowledge, do, does uh, are you able to test the blood, for example, that you've already taken and you have in, in, in storage with these tests, or is this something that is prospective for, this, for new donors? When we set the test up, it will take its place along with the other tests over here, and we'd be done routinely on all donated blood before that blood is, excuse the term, released for transfusion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. <coughs> Dr. I'd like to direct our attention to paragraph 46 of the report by FDA. And that states that approximately 350 possible discrepancies existed in the donor deferral databases. The FDA investigated about 20 of these, or exactly 20, and concluded that unsuitable blood products had been released from three donors a finding which you dis dispute. Uh, you and I discussed that in our earlier colloquy. Now, as regards the other 330 cases, can you make the statement categorically that there have been no unsuitable releases which occurred in connection with those 330 cases and that no patient has been put at risk? Um, Mr. Chairman, if I might take just a moment to review this uh, uh, observation here to be sure I can answer appropriately. That would be appropriate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I take just a moment to confer with one of my associates? This wasn't a, an item that I spent a lot of time familiarizing myself with last night. That would be appropriate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, it's it's uh, my understanding that uh, we don't in any way dispute uh, or uh, uh, disagree with this observation. Uh, a discrepancy within the donor deferral registry may occur for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, if the donor comes back and there's an error in the spelling of their name on the next visit or an error in the digit on their birth date or an error in the digit on their Social Security number, all these things can uh, cause discrepancies when the donor's information is entered in two different ways. Utility programs are run to try to sort this out, and uh, the utility programs identified these, uh, and they were being dealt with uh, prior to and at the time of the inspection, but this is an accurate observation. Okay. Now, Doctor, the problem that the committee has, for example, if you get a wrong Social Security number, and you got two Mary Smiths, or you got one Mary Smith with two social security numbers, and you know that Mary Smith with one social security number is 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 a person who's at risk that would be deferred, but you got a Mary Mary Smith who shows up with a different social security number, which is wrongly entered, or rather uh, the c correct social security number, improperly entered, then you've got a potential for believing that 
that you have two Mary Smiths when in fact you have one. And this could, if that Mary Smith happens to have an, an, an HIV infection or to show up positive for their, for their, for their antibodies, uh, you've, got, you've got a problem in that you may potentially be exposing persons to blood from a Mary Smith for whom you should have an adequately operated deferral file. Is, am I correct on that? Yes, sir. Now, so we've got here 350 cases that FDA looked at. They found 350 possible discrepancies. They looked at 20 of them. They found that there was reason to believe that they said that unsuitable blood products had been released from 13 donors. You say that, that, that there's not reason to believe that. We then dissected that statement, and we came to the conclusion that you could not say that in three of those 20, that bad blood had not been released. Uh, we agreed that this is a test which is, in fact, uh, a test which should be applied because of the broad and serious health implications. Now, this brings us down to the point where we have approximately 15 percent of the 20 sample or the 20 donor sample, in which we cannot say that, they, that the releases of blood are in fact safe. And that leaves us 330 other cases. If we assume that the statistical mechanism is sound, in other words, that, that 3 out of 20 give us a 15 percent risk, that leaves us a 15 percent risk if we apply it across the remaining 330 or something on the order of about 45 cases where we cannot say that, that blood uh, which was released was in fact safe. Perhaps that is not a valid form of reasoning and I would like to have you comment on that. But I would like to have you again, if you would, in your comments, exclude the fact that bad blood was released in, say, 45 percent if we proceed on a strict statistical basis. Now, I've given you a jawbreaker of a question. If you, want, if you want us to go over it, I'll be glad to try and do so. But would you give us your comments, Doctor? Yes, let me try to deal with this. First of all, uh, uh, in two ways. One is, as you cone down on the numbers, uh, I would emphasize the 300 and some uh, 350 cases here, it's my understanding, are uh, individuals that were identified by operating these utility programs. And although I'm not sure of the complete size of the Portland's uh, donor deferral registry, it would probably maintain, uh, contain the names, uh, the coded identity of many thousands of individuals, all the rest of the registry apparently being suitable uh, so that the 350 are a part of several thousand. And that, but I, I can't then. Uh, we're, not, we're not challenging the several okay. thousand. We are challenging the 330. Of the 350 that were identified through the use of the utility That's program. Correct. The other, the other theme that I'd like to respond with, however, to all of these issues about the donor deferral registry is that it is only one part of the safety system that we use for these units. Uh, um, for blood, for if we don't find in the operation of the donor referral registry a donor who should be identified because of these kinds of problems, and if that unit of blood goes on through the system and is released, the unit of blood will be will undergo all of the infectious disease tests, and that donor will be subjected to all of the FDA's questions about their health history. So what it would mean is that on the day of donation, that if that blood went all the way through the system, the donor would have met all of the FDA's criteria for as a suitable donor. And if that person had showed up as a first-time donor uh, and given us the history in the laboratory uh, pattern of tests, it would, have been a it would have been considered a suitable unit of blood for transfusion. Now, in no way is that meant to minimize the fact that this registry has to work better. That's why I'm going to scrap it. Well, but we have established, remember, first, that, th that the registry isn't working as it should. But we have also established that blood appears to have gotten out in three cases, or at least that you cannot make the statement today that the blood did not get out in three cases. 
and that you cannot make today the statement that the blood was in fact safe. Uh, the statement I'd make, Mr. Chairman, is that the blood, that blood that did get out on the day of donation, other than the fact that the donor was in the donor deferral registry, on the day of donation would have met all the FDA's criteria for a suitable medical history and negative laboratory tests. So it shouldn't have been released, and I don't argue with that at all, but it shouldn't have been released because some p time in the past <clears throat> that donor either told us something about their history or had an abnormal laboratory test in the past that caused them to be put in the file to say that in the future we actually shouldn't release the blood. But on well, the day of the donation, everything was fine. Let us shift our attention to the 330 cases as opposed to the three cases or the 20 cases. Can you make the bald, flat statement sitting there today that no unsuitable releases occurred in the other 330 cases? In the... I, I, I can't. No, I can't. I don't I, believe we've looked at all those, uh, or at least I'm not aware of the data enough to say that. So no, I can't. I can't make that statement. Well, we have 330 cases then, in where we, in which we have no assurance that the blood released was in fact safe. Very good. Uh, the one thing I would like to add to this general line, though, is, uh, and I'm sure you'll ask Dr. Quinnen about this uh, later this afternoon, but uh, he has been uh, quoted, at least in the media, as indicating that it appears uh, that no infectious uh, units were released for transfusion. And so I, you know, we keep coming Are back to Are you sure this. you can make the, the bald, flat statement that no units, which were in fact in infected, were released for transfusion of that 330 units? No, I can't. Can't. Okay. Very well. My time has expired. The chair is going to recognize members for questions again. And uh, chair, we'll start with the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden. Th thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I, th I think now we're touching on the, the central, central question. In my opening statement, I talked about unsuitable blood being released in these 350 cases. And it, it, it seems to me that uh, now uh, the question is, shouldn't uh, the letter from the Portland uh, Red Cross uh, saying that there were no problems and the inspection didn't lead to the discovery of the release of, uh, of uh, proven or probably infected blood products. Shouldn't this letter from Portland uh, be withdrawn and, uh, and retracted today? I mean, you have told both Chairman Dingell and uh, myself with respect to these uh, uh, questions about unsuitable products uh, being released that you know of uh, no instances. But I don't see how you can, uh, you can make that uh, statement, given the fact that uh, in these 330 cases, there seems to be no proof whatsoever what's happened to them. Shouldn't Dr. Patum retract this letter today? Um, let me take the questions one at a time. Well, the, I, the first it, one is, shouldn't this letter be retracted today from Portland? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I don't like uh, I, I don't like all the the tone of the letter and things about it. But let me focus on the 350 cases here for a minute. I've just got some information from uh, uh, people who are more aware of this than I that the the uh, Portland Center has finished uh, the investigation of these 350 cases, and this did not result in any uh, recalls of formerly distributed units. Now what that would mean to me is when they finished the investigation of all these units, they did not find anything that was so unsatisfactory that it would be necessary under FDA regulations to issue a recall or a market withdrawal from those units. So if they were unsatisfactory, they would have had to have been recalled and withdrawn. Uh, uh, but, but Dr. McCulley, yeah. you just told Chairman Dingell just a second ago that in those 330 instances, you could not confirm that uh, the blood uh, was safe and it had been unsuitably uh, released. And yet you seem to want to stand by the letter that says that there uh, is no question about the safety of all those products. Seems to me Dr. Patum's letter is in direct contradiction with what you just told Chairman Dingell about those 330 products that you cannot attest to the safety for. 
I think what, uh, what we're all saying in different ways is that while there's no disagreement that uh, all of these procedures were not properly followed uh, and things were not done in the way they should have been done, <clears throat> that this, and this can result in units being considered technically unsuitable, that we have no reason to believe at this point that any of these units were infectious and would have represented a health hazard to, the pay, to anyone who might have received them. Be happy to. Again, doctor, you're not able to make the flat, bald statement that that is so. Is That's that right? right. In, in our, in our, our problem, cases. In, but back to the, would permit, I'm sorry, excuse just, me. In our problem here is this is not, this, this is not hostile. What we're trying to do is to see to it we get a system that works in all particulars. And so we don't have to stay up nights worrying about whether, whether it's working. And, and when people get the blood, they don't have to worry, was, was, was the blood in fact safe? And I apologize to the gentleman for the use of his time. I, I thank the, the chair, and it just seems to me that what Dr. McCulloch told you with respect to those 330 cases that they cannot attest to the safety to directly contradicts what Dr. Patoon told me in this letter because you cannot tell us, and you answered that to Chairman Dingle, in those 330 cases that uh, that blood was unquestionably safe. Here's the, the issue, I think, the, the bottom line question that my constituents want, you know, today, uh, Dr. Uh, McCulloch, and that is, is the testing system in Portland good enough so that you can say today that no one received infected blood? We have no evidence that anybody received infected blood. The testing system uh, in blood banking throughout the United States is not where I would like it to be. The enormous 100 million additional tests has created problems, and that's one of the reasons we're here. And I'm the first to uh, recognize and admit that uh, the system is not operating as tightly uh, as it must. Well, on is, balance, isn't, I had, isn't one of the isn't one of the reasons that you have no evidence is that uh, you are unable to perform confirmatory testing in Portland in accord with the rules, both of the headquarters and the FDA? Confirmatory testing for... Yeah, the, in, for in the case of the uh, blood that was initially reactive uh, for the AIDS uh, uh, virus, uh, there uh, it was uh, required that that blood be tested uh, immediately. The wrong blood uh, uh, wasn't tested. The, wrong, uh, the, the correct blood wasn't tested. Um, according to, according to, to the FDA records. Refer, referring to one of the mm -hmm. citations, which... Uh, item four. Item, on, four. item four on the Portland report. Mm -hmm. That's one that is uh, um, an example of uh, what I'm discussing, that uh, there, the procedure, there were, appeared to be transcription errors in the recording of the unit numbers, and so the, uh, the laboratory data do not, uh, 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 are not available to substantiate that the repeat testing was done. I would emphasize, though, I think we're all correct in all the things that we're saying. Uh, that that testing was not uh, correct and not adequate and not properly done, those units of blood never left the facility. This error was identified while the units of blood were still in the building at the Red Cross. They never left the building. Well, let's... So let's nobody was injured and nobody got tainted blood. Also, uh, I'd what, like to what, say... What you, what you have said continually is that you have no evidence of this. In your opening statement, you said, to the best of your knowledge. Uh, at one point, you said you have no uh, indication. And yet, to Chairman Dingell, when he asked about 330 cases of uh, discrepancies, you said that you really couldn't uh, say whether uh, this blood uh, was safe. And, and you have said that we're all correct. I, I gather you're saying I'm correct and, you know, and you're correct. I but I think that they're, they're clearly here. Um, 
are some areas of, of disagreement, and I, th I think what I'd like to do in my remaining time is just go to the FDA inspection report and, and get your uh, reaction to a couple of the items. In paragraph four of the FDA inspection report, the FDA found, uh, based on Portland's records, that a unit of blood that tested positive for AIDS was uh, released without further testing because another unit was tested instead. Do you dispute that this is what the Portland records indicated at the time of the FDA inspection? No, I don't. Has the Red Cross discovered new information since the FDA inspection which would indicate that a testing error was not made, and if so, has the FDA now accepted the new information? Uh, no. Uh, we do not, I'm not aware of any information that would indicate that the testing was any different than described in this uh, citation. Based on the information in the FDA report that Portland Blood Bank records indicated that three units uh, in question were initially positive and were not further tested, how could you presume that they were anything but positive? Uh, let, me, <clears throat> let me add one thing to the Observation number four before we leave it. I would like to re-emphasize that's the unit of blood that I referred to that was identified uh, prior to leaving the facility. Here we get back to the technical term released. Uh, it did not leave the facility and did not leave the control of the Portland Center. Nobody received this blood. Nobody got infected from it. Tainted blood was not released in this case. So you want to go to two and three. Yeah, again, I, I must say I think that there's um, some confusion uh, with respect uh, to the uh, AIDS uh, uh, blood uh, that was released without uh, further testing. You've said that uh, you don't dispute this is what the Portland records uh, indicated. Uh, you just told me that uh, the Red Cross has not discovered any new information since the FDA inspection would indicate uh, that would indicate a testing error was not made, and yet you made the statement yesterday in uh, a press release that uh, no units uh, of blood uh, were uh, released uh, or transfused uh, on an absolute basis. I don't see how you can make a statement like that when you tell me first you don't uh, dispute what the FDA found in the report and then you tell me in response uh, to my specific question that the Red Cross hasn't discovered any new information since the F, uh, FDA inspection. It all hinges on the word release. Well, Released in the technical term within blood banking is accurate uh, as it's cited in the FDA report. Released to a hospital for transfusion is a different process. That's the sort of thing I was referring to in my statement yesterday. This blood didn't leave the building. The gentleman you be happy to. Doctor, you just put your finger on something. You said the blood did not leave the building. That is a source of comfort. Would that blood have left the building had had FDA not been out there to to engage in that particular inquiry? I'd have to ask to be sure about the answer to your question specifically, but in and I'd be glad to do that if you want. In general, uh, uh, I would agree with your concern, and it's another illustration of how this, the system and the procedures are not as tight as they have to be. Now, the, 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 ahead, system, yeah. the system was here really blessed or assisted in its operation by having the food and drugs show up and identify these particular units of blood. And because the FDA identified these particular units of blood, while they were still in the building, they didn't get out of the building. Had FDA not appeared to identify this, these particular units of blood, are we able to have any certainty whatsoever that that blood would not then have gotten out of the, out of the building and that the Red Cross would not then have identified that particular blood and pulled it out of the stream of distribution? I'd, I'd have to ask uh, uh, for advice as to, I don't know for sure whether this error was discovered by the staff separate from the investigation or whether it was identified by the investigators. I'm sure we can I find that out. In fairness to everybody, we ought, we ought to have the answer to that yeah, question. We'll I, I'd, it, like, uh, I'd like to know. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if it was FDA which caught this, 
then we have to assume that's, that, that, that that is clear evidence that the system is not working. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that so? Yes. And so then you have a number of units which then would have gotten out of the building but for the intervention of FDA. Yes. I thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I just find this a, a very a curious matter. Uh, Dr. McCulloch has said repeatedly today that he has no evidence that bad blood or blood uh, uh, that uh, uh, was reactive for AIDS or hepatitis uh, uh, went out. And yet you asked him repeatedly, Mr. Chairman, to whether he could say bald-faced that that was the case uh, in the area of those 330 uh, discrepancies. And you told the chairman that you could not make that bald-faced uh, assertion. Now, I think my constituents would find it very helpful if we could just reconcile those two, two matters. Well, let me try to reconcile it because I didn't have the information on the little yellow sheet of paper when I answered the chairman's question. And the information, that, the information that has been passed to me is no products were released from these 330 donors. This is from the staff of our Portland Center. Doctor, l l let's address that. You're not in the blood storage business. You collect blood, you process it, and you distribute it. Why did none of this three? Not, why did none of these 330 units get out of the building and get into the distribution system? Was it because because you collect them and store them? Was it because your own system caught them, or was it because FDA warned you about them? I'm, I I don't know. Uh, well, we, I'd be glad to find that and out. Until but. we have reason to know what the answer to that question might be, we must assume that the system is not working to deal with with blood, which may perhaps be put put the recipient at risk. Well, I think, uh, as I've indicated a number of times already, the donor deferral registry is not working the way uh, it should. It, uh, by and large, works very effectively, but there are errors and there are things that it doesn't catch, and this is a good example of them. And I, I would suspect that the loudest complainer about the failure of the system would be the guy that got the bad blood if it gets, if it gets through into the distribution. I think also some of the, maybe my discussion with Congressman Wyden is uh, that I'm saying that I don't have any evidence there was a problem, and he's saying, can you assure me there wasn't? I don't have any evidence that... Uh, now, uh, let's, let's look at that. The, the uh, fellow who is distributing the blood, he's going to be comforting by saying, I don't have any evidence that there are problems. The fellow who's going to get the blood, He's going to have a little different view. He's yep. going to prefer the second test, and that is that the, that that uh, that there is no not that there was no evidence that there were problems, but that there but that he has assur positive assurances that the system is was safe and functioning as it should. I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, and that's the kind of system I expect well, and hope to put into place. Doctor, we 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 thank you for your presence here, and and uh, we want you to know that uh, the. Uh, questions have been hard, but we have tried to ask them in a way which would indicate that we have a great deal of faith in you and a great deal of belief that you're really trying to make this system function better and, and uh, you, uh, uh, you have the good wishes of the committee that you'll be successful in that undertaking and we will of course be seeking to assist you in that effort as we consider our, as we continue our inquiry into these matters. The Chair has been advised by the members that there are no further questions. so. We excuse you with our thanks and that and also uh, your 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 friend and our friend Mr. Fitzpatrick and if you can get us some answers to the to the residual questions which have not been responded to here that, that you and I were discussing earlier it will be of assistance to the committee. Our next panel Thank you doctor. Our next panel is a um, the panel composed of members of the Federal Food and Drug Administration uh, Dr. Gerald Quinnen, Jr., M.D., Acting Director, Center for Biologics. Uh, P. Ann Hope, Dis uh, Act Acting Director, Division of Transfusion Science. Uh, Mr. Thomas Bazo, Director, Division of Compliance. Mary Carden, National Expert Investigator for Biologics of the Buffalo District Office. Mr. Gerald E. Vance and Diane Mul uh, Director, Dallas District, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and Diane Maloney, Associate Chief Counsel for Biologics. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for being present and for your assistance to us today. Uh, if you will come forward, um, we will, we will uh, get you your place at the table and, and proceed to qualify you as witnesses.
Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, committee thanks you all for being present here today to assist us in our inquiries. Uh, it is the practice, as you all know, that all witnesses who appear before the committee testify under oath. Ladies and gentlemen, do you or any of you object to appearing here under oath? Very well. The record will indicate that uh, you have no objection. The chair also advises that given the fact that you are appearing under oath, it is your right to be advised by counsel during the course of your appearance. Do any of you desire to be advised by counsel during your appearance here? Uh, the answer is, the, do you desire to be advised by counsel or not? Uh, our, our reporter, who is wonderful, has no nod button. You've got to say yes or no. Uh, is the answer yes or no? No. No. Very good. Uh, the uh, uh, chair advises that copies of the rules of the committee, the subcommittee, and rules of the House are there for you to assist you in understanding both the, your, your rights and the limitations on the powers of the committee as you appear here before us. If you then have no objection to testifying under oath, will you each please rise and raise your right hand. Ladies and gentlemen, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give today is truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Ladies and gentlemen, you may each consider yourself under oath, and uh, we will recognize you in such order as you choose for presenting such statements to the committee as you wish to give today. Uh, you, will, you will find the chair will, will advise you that our public address system is about the worst you'll ever deal with. So I, I would uh, suggest for the good of everybody that you get as close to him as you can and speak in a good, vigorous voice. Doctor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Dr. Gerald Quinnen, Acting Director of the Food and Drug Administration's Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. I'm accompanied today by Mrs. Ann Hoppe, Acting Director of the Division of Transfusion Science and Mr. Thomas Bozzo, Director of the Office of Compliance, both from the same center. Also with me on my right is Mr. Gerald Vince, Director of the Office of Regional Operations, Office of Regulatory Affairs, and to the left, Mrs. Mary Carden, an FDA field investigator with ex expertise in the area of biologics, and Ms. Diane Maloney, Associate Chief Counsel for Biologics. We appreciate the opportunity to be here to discuss with the subcommittee the results of nationwide efforts to enhance the safety of the blood supply in this country. In the course of my presentation, I will describe to you how the safety level of our blood supply has increased progressively and dramatically over the last two decades. I will also discuss the current status of the blood banking industry that has undergone substantial changes in recent years and how this agency plans to make further improvements. Our intent is to carry out a twofold effort, including timely policy implementation and enforcement. We have greatly increased both the quantity and quality of our enforcement activities over the past several years and continue to implement mechanisms to enhance further the safety of the blood supply. The AIDS epidemic focused attention on many public health issues, including blood safety. One of the first actions undertaken early in the epidemic by the FDA in March 1983 was the development of criteria for deferring prospective blood donors at increased risk of transmitting disease. Data collected since that time indicate that implementation of this practice of deferring high-risk donors was highly effective. In addition, prior to the isolation of the AIDS virus, important advances were made in improving products used for the treatment of hemophilia. FDA scientists and others were able to develop new hate and chemical treatment techniques that inactivated the virus in the antihemophilic factors 8 and 9. 
After the etiologic agent of AIDS was identified, a test was developed to detect antibodies to the AIDS virus in blood. Blood screening was begun in March 1985 and markedly reduced transfusion transmission of this agent. Without the intervention of these highly sensitive tests and the donor deferral criteria, the risk of transmitting this disease by transfusion would presently be as high as 0.4 percent. Instead, the current risk is about one per 100,000 units, meaning that our current strategies are preventing about 998 of every thousand infections that might occur in their absence. With respect to other infectious agents, factors such as seroconversion, such as conversion to a volunteer blood donor system, donor deferral criteria, and implementation of specific screening tests have had substantial impact. Infections which have been largely prevented include hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HTLV-1, and HTLV-2. During the same time, alternatives to general blood donor products have been developed, including increased use of self-donation and intraoperative blood salvage. Additionally, significant efforts were expended to reduce human and mechanical errors causing inappropriate release of units from quarantine. These collective improvements have produced a substantial increase in the safety of the blood supply. The prospect for the next several years is for the safety of the blood supply to continue to improve progressively, but through great effort. Further improvements in safety await the development of better tests, better strategies for donor selection, inactivation of infectious agents, or elimination of sporadic errors in blood banks. Let me now discuss briefly FDA's surveillance and in inspection activities from recent years in more detail. Because of a number of recalls of blood due to possible contamination, FDA changed the inspection rank rate for blood banks in 1988 from a statutory biennial rate to an annual rate. In addition, the amount of time spent preparing for and conducting each inspection has increased. These changes reflected the increase in complexity of blood banking, the adoption of new testing technology, and the need to focus on resultant problem areas. The degree of seriousness of the violations observed by FDA during inspections is assessed in relation to the potential public health impact and that guides the determination of the enforcement actions that are subsequently taken. Deficiencies in blood bank practices carry with them a potential for disease transmission. However, to our knowledge, infusion of actual confirmed positive units as a result of deficiencies has been an exceedingly rare event. The American Red Cross occupies a unique status in our blood banking system. It manages about half the nation's blood supply. Along with the rest of the industry, it has undergone many changes over the last several years. Because of the enormous complexity of the Red Cross, these changes created coordination difficulties that has, have also been reflected in inspectional findings. As has been discussed in September 1988, FDA and the Red Cross signed an agreement under which the Red Cross agreed to modify and improve its operation nationwide. This agreement did not replace existing requirements but supplemented them. The efforts of the Red Cross to meet requirements of that agreement is ongoing. The details of their progress are included in the written testimony that we have submitted. Subsequent to the agreement, FDA prepared an enforcement strategy to supplement our existing compliance programs regarding the Red Cross. Over the ensuing two and a half years, FDA has determined that three regional centers met the threshold for regulatory action under this enforcement strategy. In the last two days, special attention has been given to the recent findings in one of those centers, that in Portland, Oregon. The deficiencies that were found were very significant and led the agency to issuing yesterday a notice of our intent to revoke the license of that facility if comprehensive corrective action is not taken immediately. In verbal communications, we have had with the Red Cross 
they have indicated that they are in the process of taking those corrective actions. The FDA will make sure that all necessary corrections are made and intends to follow up on this matter aggressively. The information we have available to us does not indicate that the transfusion of infectious unit of units of blood has occurred, but as you have indicated, uh, this matter is not completely resolved. The FDA will use all measures at its disposal to ensure that that region of the country will continue to be provided with a safe and adequate blood supply. As I mentioned earlier, FDA is developing an initiative through which safety of the blood supply can be increased at this time. The two basic elements of the initiative will focus on, first, the implementation of enforcement strategies and quality assurance programs that will result in full compliance in blood banks. And second, efforts to further reduce the transmission of infectious diseases by blood transfusion. The agency will develop guidance that will define methods blood banks can use to assure that they are in compliance with our regulations. We also plan to carry out a comprehensive review of issues related to blood donor registries and linkages between them. A variety of activities for enhanced coordination and public communication will support these initiatives. In conclusion, I must say that great strides have been made in recent years that have significantly increased the safety of the blood supply. There has been a remarkable decrease in the transmission of viral diseases through transfusion. Blood is safer than it has ever been, and I believe the public can and should have confidence in the integrity of the blood supply. However, in this imperfect world, blood will never be risk-free. I can pledge to you that the FDA will continue to vigilantly monitor and protect the nation's blood supply to the best of its ability. That concludes my prepared statement, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Quinnan. Uh, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden, is recognized. Thank you uh, very much. Just one question uh, for you, if I might, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Quinnan. It seems to me that the action you've taken in Portland, in effect, sending them a notice to revoke their license, appears to be a very significant, very dramatic uh, action. Is that, is that true? Is that a fair interpretation of it? It is a very significant action. And I gather that this is rarely uh, done, that over, say, the last three years, the action you've taken with respect to the Portland uh, blood bank has been taken, oh, in only a handful of cases over the last three years. As I said, in the last two and a half years, it's been taken in two other cases. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Cardin, let me again thank you and uh, welcome you. You're been very helpful, the subcommittee, throughout uh, our inquiry, and I'm very pleased that you uh, personally were involved in the situation uh, uh, in Portland. One um, general question, uh, if I might, and then we'll get into the specifics. You, you read this report about, about Portland, uh, 51 particular uh, conditions cited appear to be considerably more even than in some of the other areas where you find uh, you found problems. Would you say that uh, the problems in, uh, in Portland are extremely serious on the basis of what you found uh, in this report? Yes, I'd agree with that. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll get to uh, uh, some Portland-specific questions uh, in a moment, but I also want to try to put this in the context of where we are in terms of the overall uh, agreement uh, uh, between uh, the Red Cross and, uh, and the Food uh, and Drug Administration. Based on, on your current uh, knowledge, and uh, especially in light of uh, what you found uh, in Portland, does the Red Cross now seem to be in compliance with the September 1988 voluntary agreement uh, with the Food and Drug Administration? No. Without revealing any specific dates or Red Cross uh, collection centers, could you cite some specific examples of violations of the voluntary agreement that have been discovered in, say, just the last year? Well, there were several elements to the voluntary agreement. Um, one of the key elements was correction of problems with standard operating procedures. 
and inspections continue to reveal serious problems at the regional level and that in some instances there's a complete lack of SOPs in some very critical areas or employees are not trained properly and are not following these SOPs or that the SOPs in place are so inadequate that the employees cannot properly carry out the procedures. Uh, during an inspection, we had reviewed an SOP which instructed an employee how to perform a particular task. However, in observing this employee, they were found not to be following the SOP. When we inquired, we were told the SOP in place was no longer used, that the operators had figured out a way to perform the task involved. And this is not the level of control that we expect in a blood bank. all the problem centers, or if it is, corrections are not being made or maybe not being made quickly enough. The firm's audit program should be more comprehensive than FDA's, yet one center that we inspected had, a, had an audit that lasted only a couple of days, and it was just before the investigation conducted by FDA investigators. Um, another key element to the voluntary agreement revolved around corrections to the computer systems. Most target dates that have been sent, set since the voluntary agreement was signed in September 1988 for correction have come and gone with no corrections made. A recent inspection identified a region using a system that both Red Cross and FDA had discussed in September of 88 as containing some serious flaws. The region is in the process of preparing to change that system but told the investigators they could not provide us with target dates any longer because each one that they have set they, has come and gone. Um, another key element of the voluntary agreement revolved around procedures to make corrections to the databases, which was discussed earlier with Dr. McCullough. And the inspection, of course, in Portland revealed that the region had not begun to address this particular problem until late in 1990. And I think that the FD43 that was issued real, identifies some of the problems that have occurred as a result of the fact that they had not, had not yet addressed that problem fully. Okay. Were, were many of the problems that you found in, uh, in Portland similar to the specific examples of violations of the voluntary agreement uh, that you discovered? Yes. Okay. What about uh, Red Cross compliance with FDA regulations in areas other than those uh, covered by the voluntary agreement? Have there been violations there as well? Well, one issue not specifically addressed in the voluntary agreement and which was identified as a problem during the inspection of National ARC is the submission of error reports. In following the inspection of National Red Cross last May of 1990, I understand that a large number of error reports were submitted to the agency. We have not been back to National ARC to assure ourselves all the reports received at National have in fact been forwarded onto the agency. But at least two FDA inspections of regional blood centers have found significant errors where unsuitable blood products were released and no error reports were submitted to National ARC and therefore they were not submitted to the agency. Do you, uh, do you think it would be useful to require blood establishments to send copies of accident and error reports to the appropriate uh, FDA field office and, and uh, that might uh, help uh, deal with these problems? It would be helpful if the error reports were submitted directly to the district office, especially in the case of ARC where the error reports have to travel from the regional blood center to their national headquarters, to the Center for Biologics, and then back to the district office. And I, I gather in Portland you found uh, this problem as well, that error reports as it related to blood that had been erroneously uh, released, those error reports had not been filed with the national office of the headquarters in accordance with the timeliness regulations and then sent to the FDA. There was one instance cited, Jess. Okay. Uh, let me ask uh, the chairman if I have any additional time or maybe he wants to recognize my colleagues and I'll get another round. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wyden. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to follow up on a couple of questions uh, from the, uh, the Red Cross, Dr. Quinnen. Dr. Quinnen, it is my understanding, and it came out uh, in earlier questioning that the test for HIV-2 is now in existence and in fact it's being used in a number of European countries 
Yet very few U.S. blood banks have adopted it here, and there is not, in essence, a mandate uh, for a test on HIV-2. Is that correct? And, and if, if so, maybe you can give me some reasons why. That's correct. And the reason it's not mandated is that the evidence indicates that there is not significant risk of HIV-2 transmission by blood transfusion in the U.S. We have in place uh, uh, one specific donor deferral criteria, uh, which we think is more than adequate to address that need at present. Uh, we'll continue to monitor this situation, and at the point in time where it becomes of value to implement testing, we will certainly move quickly to make that uh, recommendation and a requirement. How many confirmed cases of uh, HIV-2 have we found in this country and, and dating over what period of time? Uh, over the total time period of the AIDS epidemic, the number is approximately 20. I don't have the exact number at hand with me this morning. Uh, most of those are what are referred to as imported cases. I understand that there is a test that you all are are looking at not at now, which in essence can test uh, for both HIV and HIV-2, HIV-1 and HIV-2 in the same test, uh, and it is under review at the FDA. Is that correct? That's correct. And do you expect uh, to actually recommend, uh, it, at what point, where, the, where is the status of, of your regula regulations with that regard? The, the test is under review, which means I can't uh, disclose an open session here, any timetables for approval, for example. Uh, I would, could focus on one concern or area of concern that we need to be sure about before we approve it, and that is to make sure that it is completely as sensitive as the existing tests for HIV-1. If we add a capability for HIV-2 but lose the capability for HIV-1, we would be worse off. Sure. And we'll make sure that it's sufficient in that regard before it's approved. Uh, the policy regarding regulation, I don't know if you're referring to our uh, making recommendations that HIV-2 testing be done. Uh, we will continue to monitor that and make the recommendation at any time that it appears relevant. Do you have any evidence that the uh, that it is uh, that this new technique, I guess I should how the best way that I should describe it is is not sensitive uh, to HIV one? Again, I don't think I can disclose details early? of review of trade secret data here in open session. Um, what I will will emphasize is that the demonstration that it is as sensitive is a highly technical scientific issue, and we will make sure that it is. It's not a simple matter of review and easy approval of a test of this nature. Okay, thank you. Ms. Cardin, uh, let me read to you a finding. Uh, in fact, it's finding number one of the FDA inspection report. On February 1st of this year, whole blood number 21F99283 and number 21F99353 were initially reactive for both hepatitis B surface antigen and no additional testing was performed. The following products manufactured from these whole blood products were released and shipped. Uh, one of those numbers, uh, 353 at the end for red blood cells, cryoprecipitate, AHF, and recovered plasma, uh, number 21F99283, for red blood cells, platelets, and frozen plasma. The American Red Cross uh, apparently last night told the subcommittee staff that this finding was simply wrong and that the FDA incorrectly evaluated the blood tests. Are you aware of any information to support that claim? I've not been provided with any other information, no. Do you know if, uh, in fact, the blood was shipped or not? I do not have all the records with me to indicate which of the products were distributed versus maybe expired in-house or were not transfused later on. But if they're listed here uh, as they are where it indicates that these products were released and shipped, we do have records that they were shipped. Whether they were actually transfused, we would have to go to the hospital and, and um, um, ask them that information. And 
since this is a very recent inspection, sometimes the Red Cross is still in the process of recalling the blood products when we close out the inspection. So I would have to see what records they had. Maybe you could provide us that information a little bit later on and, and communicate with the Red Cross. Does that sound fair? I see a nod behind you. Okay, I, I see him. I, I'll you on that point. I, I thank him for his graciousness and that of the that of the chairman because this is this is really a gut question for for my constituents at at home, uh, Ms. Gar, uh, Ms. Carden, uh, Mr. Upton. Uh, asked you the question of uh, the Red Cross's statement last night, which was a statement saying that uh, the subcommittee uh, was, uh, was incorrect uh, uh, with respect uh, to the way it characterized uh, uh, the uh, hepatitis uh, test and, and, uh, and, uh, and the AIDS, uh, AIDS test. And you've told us that there is no information that you know of to support the claim uh, that they made uh, last night and you're not aware uh, as to whether or not the blood was shipped as well? No, I'm aware that the blood products were shipped okay. and that some were transfused, but I cannot, without the records that, that right. the FDA has in hand, identify which were transfused and which were not. I, I just want to make clear then for the record that Ms. Carden has said that the Food and Drug Administration statement last night was simply incorrect no, with Excuse me, the American Red Cross's statement last night was simply uh, incorrect uh, as to the subcommittee's characterization of the uh, blood initially reactive for uh, hepatitis uh, uh, B and, uh, and the AIDS virus, and that in addition to that, it's Ms. Carden's understanding that that blood was shipped and that uh, she is also stating that that blood was uh, transfused as well. I, I think that um, based on what was um, uh, the questions asked of Dr. McCullough, there may be one item that I can clarify for you, and that I believe is item number four. And you'll notice what the wording that we used was, they were re released and available for distribution, and we talked about what the word released means. And what happened in this particular instance was that we, on our review of the records, identified the problem. So we brought it to their attention, and uh, the, the Red Cross Center there went to look for those units and happened to find those still in-house. They had been released from their own quality assurance system and would have been shipped had we not found the error. Okay. I thank my colleague for, for yielding. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Lind, is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, looked very quickly at some of the uh, charts that you have attached to your very complete testimony uh, involving enforcement actions and the number of regulatory letters, suspensions, denials, revocations, recalls, and so forth. It's been suggested to uh, the committee that to the extent the FDA and blood bankers are placed in a continuing adversarial and confrontational relationship, the integrity of the blood supply system and the safety of the blood supply itself will be proportionately at greater risk. Uh, do you agree with that statement? Do you, do you, here is someone from the, from the uh, blood supply industry who is uh, advocating a less confrontational, a less adversarial relationship between you folks and them, and making the claim that the whole system would work better if that were the case. What's your reaction to that assertion? We must maintain a relationship of a regulator to a regulated industry. And I believe, I'm convinced we can do that on a professional basis and do it effectively. You feel that the relationship that now exists <clears throat> is uh, a proper balance to uh, properly regulate the blood industry, the blood service industry? I, I believe the current relationship is appropriately characterized as one of a regulator and a regulated industry dealing appropriately with each other. 
uh, and that it is the right balance. On the uh, question of the donor deferral system or the donor deferral criteria system, can you tell, can you tell me how this works? I'm a, I'm a layman and I understand that you have some sort of a system whereby you pick out certain people who may be uh, troublesome when it comes to taking their blood and uh, transfusing it. The right way. Yes, I, I think this is a very important point. The determination that a unit of blood is suitable is based on different types of evaluations. There are a large number of evaluations that are in the category of donor qualification uh, procedures, and then there are a number of additional evaluations that are uh, the results of actual tests you on the blood. The you put the man or woman's name down and his social security number, I and mean, how do you, how do you uh, put him into the system? You use a name? It, a name would be used, social security number and birth date are the ordinary so identifiers. So if you had a hepatitis carrier or an AIDS virus carrier in the system uh, registered in San Francisco and that person went to New York and walked into a blood bank, would that pop out of the computer somehow? If, if the two computer systems were linked together, it would. If they were separate from each other, then it would not. Okay. Are there, are there thousands of people listed in this system or tens of thousands? I mean, how, how big a deal is it? Just give me a rough, a ballpark figure. I, I believe the number listed in the registry in Portland is in the neighborhood of 19,000. Uh, how that reflects a total number nationwide, I don't know. Have you ever experienced any complaints from uh, gay rights groups or uh, people who feel their names were unjustly incorporated into one of these lists? I'm sure there must have been a few, but in, in general, that isn't a It hasn't become a problem. problem. Okay, good. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Hoppe, it's my understanding that agency rulemaking is quite uh, resource and time intensive. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Can you give us an idea, uh, either you or Mr. Quinnan, how many rule makings roughly are in uh, progress at FDA at the present time? In the area of blood, blood products. In the area of blood products. In the area of blood products. There are 11 uh, substantial uh, blood related uh, rules in process. Are any of these older than five years? Yes, sir. Uh, of the 11, how many would be older than five years? I would have to get you that information. Okay. Are there any as old as 10 years? Uh, I believe there may be one. It seems to me that one of the reasons behind this uh, delay in FDA rulemaking is the layers of review involved. I understand that the Edwards Commission, appointed in May 1990 by HHS Secretary Sullivan, uh, to look at and reassess the basic structure of FDA will recommend that FDA be given its own rulemaking authority without having to go through HHS. Are you familiar with the Edwards Commission's proposed recommendation in this regard? I'm familiar with some draft recommendations, but I don't think we have any final recommendation available yet. Do you have any opinion on that particular recommendation? Do you think it will help cure the uh, delay problem? Logically, it would seem that if you reduce the number of levels of review, it would shorten things. We haven't made an assessment of what the overall impact of that would be. Okay. Thank you. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lant. Uh, I have two or three questions here I want to ask Ms. Hoppe. Uh, Ms. Hoppe, since the blood centers extensively test blood, they can be considered as key monitoring centers for infectious diseases. Are blood centers currently required to report data on infectious diseases to the Centers for Disease Control? 
Not to my knowledge. Well, uh, since blood centers are on the front line in this country in terms of collecting information on new organisms in our nation's blood supply, and this information is easily collected, uh, don't you think it would be a useful idea to require blood centers to periodically report this data to the Centers for Disease Control? I think the value of that idea would have to be balanced against uh, all of the resources that we have. We have been able to get data when it is needed, that the industry has been very cooperative in providing data on a voluntary basis. The FDA, for example, in uh, cooperation with the CDC, has often collated that data and made it available in publications so that everyone can benefit from it. I don't think the FDA would ever turn down data, but I think whether or not it would be useful to routinely collect all of that data and devote the enormous number of resources it would take to that, I think would have to be looked at very carefully. You say the enormous uh, resources that would be required uh, to do that. Would you expand on that just a little? Um, why would it uh, require enormous resources just to report that to CDC? Well, first of all, there are a variety of tests that are done. There are many different products on the market available for doing those tests. The rates of the initial reactives and the repeat reactives vary somewhat from one manufacturer to another. Uh, in order to be meaningful, it would have to be uh, segmented in many different ways. And I believe that the usefulness of having those numbers when you put them all together in an aggregate would again sort of be offset by regional variations and Well, I'm talking that about the that. discovery of new organisms. I mean, if the, you discover new organisms in the blood supply, that's not reported to CDC. Would it be difficult to report that to CDC when new organisms are discovered? How, how would they report that? I, I'm sorry, that's I'm not understanding question. your question. As my question is, if, if, if in testing blood in a blood center, you, new organisms are discovered, that's not reported to CDC. Oh, I misunderstood your question. I so, thought you were asking about routine reporting of data from the required No, tests. I'm talking about new organisms, the discovery of new organisms. Oh, I would be quite sure that people would report that to CDC. Is there a requirement that that be done? That was my initial question. I don't know the requirement. I don't believe so, but it's also not the case that that would uh, generally occur in a blood bank. Where uh, was the AIDS virus? When was the AIDS virus? Where was it first discovered? The, the disease was uh, first recognized in the United States in 1981 as a result of uh, occurrence of the clinical condition in Los Angeles and New York. Uh, the virus was discovered in 1984 in France and the United States. Well, well, well as I recall, uh, you mentioned France and the United States is where it was discovered, but wasn't it discovered in blood at, uh, at Veterans Administration in Los Angeles? Wasn't that where it was first discovered? The virus was first discovered in research laboratories. Its relationship to AIDS, the disease itself. The first association uh, or mechanism of transmission that was identified as a result of epi epidemiological associations was thought to be through homosexual contact. It was later found that uh, transmission through blood and blood products was a possibility. That evidence of association with blood was not identified in blood banks, but through CDC epidemiological studies. Well, do blood centers currently share the, the data that they have with any group other than CDC with reference to new organisms? Reference to HIV? Any, any new organism. Uh, Blood centers will, from time to time, publish data that they have in the scientific literature as it is uh, of value to science to do that. Uh, in addition, both the CDC and FDA periodically conduct studies when there is data that we need in order to implement our policies appropriately. Uh, 
beyond that, uh, there may be some additional programs that they carry out, but I really can't speak to them this morning. I guess the question that I'm really, really asking is, is there some way or would it be helpful if in the processing of blood new infectious organisms are discovered that they be reported to CDC? That's, that, uh, is, this an, is this an area that would be helpful in identifying diseases and help us in dealing with, uh, with infectious diseases in our country? There are mechanisms by which people report uh, the association of infections with blood that haven't been previously recognized. An example of that is the recent recognition of Yersinia infection. It appears to, it, it would appear that that occurs on a regular basis when it happens, although it happens very rarely. Thank you, uh, not to, uh, uh, another question that I would like to ask to Ms. Toppy. Ms. Toppy, I understand there is no binding legal requirement for a physician to get specific informed consent from a patient before transfusing blood to that patient. Is that correct or not? I believe that may vary from state to state depending on state law. That's controlled by state laws, and then uh, the federal government, federal laws are not involved in that uh, that requirement. Informed consent is that true for informed consent in other areas, controlled by state law? I'm not an expert on informed consent. Anyone at the table be able to answer that question? Um, FDA gets involved in informed consent when you're talking about investigational products, and there it would be involved in reviewing the informed consent process, but otherwise I believe it is state controlled. Gentleman from uh, Oregon, Mr. Wyden. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Dr. Uh, Rowland. Let me uh, uh, return uh, to you, Ms. Cardin, if I might, for, uh, for some additional uh, questions. Uh, you know, obviously, Dr. McCulloch uh, is trying hard to make changes in, uh, in the Washington, D.C. office. But my question to you is, have you seen any significant changes in terms of the impact on blood services actually out in the field? Dr. McCullough started um, in his role as responsible head sometime after the last time I testified. Since that time, we've been able to inspect some of the ARC regional blood centers, but a reinspection of national headquarters has not been conducted yet. Therefore, we haven't verified that all changes promised have actually been made or that some of the changes made have actually improved the situation. They're going to have to demonstrate to us that change, the changes that he is in, uh, putting in place have worked. And I think it's important to remember that the changes that he needs to put in place will take some period of time. Our concern is the fact that while those changes are being made, blood products are still being distributed from those blood centers. But a as of now, and, and I think you're absolutely right in terms of, uh, of, uh, of Dr. Dr. McCulloch uh, coming into a very difficult situation, as of now, you have not really seen in terms of the field where, where people you know, get these products, you have not seen any significant changes today. I've seen him um, attempting to make some very good, important changes, but they haven't been made to the point yet where they've filtered down to stop being unsuitable blood products from, from going out the door. Well, I, I appreciate that, and that's, uh, that's helpful because that's, that's my sense as well. I think that the, the message in, in, in Washington, and, and uh, particularly the subcommittee and to Chairman Dingell, has been that uh, the Washington office wants something very different than the kind of practices the subcommittee has, uh, has seen, but, but somehow that message has not gotten to the grassroots, and you're describing uh, not having filtered down to those uh, regional offices, I think is a view that, uh, that I share. What are your thoughts on this discussion that we had earlier 
with respect to these uh, 350 possible discrepancies that were found in uh, the donor deferral uh, area in Portland. You state in the report that uh, of 20 of, uh, of the discrepancies uh, that had been reviewed, unsuitable blood products had been released uh, from three, uh, three donors. What are, the, what are the implications of the fact that there are still 330 to, to go here, and what does that mean for the people of the Northwest? I think that I need to uh, explain a little bit about what the, f the number 350 means, okay? The number 350 does not necessarily mean that all of those donors are deferred donors and therefore would potentially result in unsuitable blood products being released, okay? It, the 350, although, is a large number when, in fact, FDA investigators can only look at a small portion of those, and in that small portion that we chose to look at, which was 20, it, three donors had had products that were released because of these discrepancies that were in this database. Okay. I think that the number 350, it's very difficult to translate into statistics of what potentially could be there because one of the problems that I have is the programs that were run at that particular center in Portland were not the computer programs that identified the discrepancies would not necessarily identify all of the discrepancies in the system and those are the ones that I am also concerned about is the fact that they need to write s some additional programs and identify ways in which they can identify other discrepancies in the system. So it's very difficult to take the number 350 and give it some true meaning. Is the 350 number possibly one that would be greater if, uh, if there was further analysis? As I said, the 350 may be less because some of those are not deferral, deferred donors. But again, if you, if you uh, sort your database in a different way and identify other discrepancies, it may be greater than the 350. One other question with respect uh, uh, to Portland. Uh, on, page, on paragraph 48 of the report, uh, uh, it reads there are approximately 594 donors in the system without uh, social security numbers. And it goes on to state that this is an integral uh, a part of, uh, of, uh, of the system and then in effect says that for something like a year and a half uh, there's been no effort to try to correct the records and, uh, and to investigate this. Is this a serious matter and, and if it is uh, perhaps you could explain that? Yes, that's exactly what I'm referring to in the fact that all of the discrepancies have not been identified. If you don't have a social security number for the donor in that donor record, you can't do a sort on it to try to find some of the discrepancies that are there. So those as, that item as well could represent uh, donors who, um, or blood products that could potentially go out, yes. Is it possible that some of these donors could be deferred uh, donors and the Portland uh, uh, Red Cross because of the way they keep records wouldn't even know it? Some of those donors without the social security numbers could be deferred donors, that's correct. Um, there are there is another means by which the donor could potentially be identified, but to have the system working the way it is supposed to, you need the Social Security number in the system. And Portland does not have, in those 594 cases, the Portland, the Portland system doesn't have the prerequisite to make the system work properly. Isn't that correct? I'd say that was correct, yes. Okay. All right. uh, Mr. Chairman, I would also ask unanimous consent that at this point uh, the uh, report that we've been discussing essentially over the last three, four hours could uh, be formally uh, introduced uh, into, uh, into the record. And, and I know my time's up, Mr. Chairman, and look forward to another round. Uh, without, uh, without objection. The gentleman, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Lent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Hoppe, at the uh, subcommittee's July 1990 hearing, several of the witnesses suggested that the FDA's Blood Products Advisory Committee could be strengthened by including one or more members who are practicing physicians involved with transfusion medicine. The idea behind this suggestion comes from the period when the question of whether or not AIDS was a bloodborne disease was being debated well after it was obvious that the disease was being passed via transfusion. Practicing physicians, it is reasoned, will be likely to see the next blood-borne disease as it occurs in patients and could play an early warning role. 
What is your opinion on this proposal? I believe it has merit. Okay. Next. Another suggestion is that the Blood Products Advisory Committee have a consumer representative and that this person be a voting member. This concept has been recently endorsed by the Council of Community Blood Centers, which suggests a medical expert with a consumer advocate point of view, citing the Consumers Union as an organization that could provide such a person. Uh, given the fact that so many of our nation's consumer advocates very often are more interested in gathering press for themselves than in solving problems, we have one in New York State, our state uh, consumer advocate, who is sort of a publicity hound gadfly type. Uh, do you think uh, that the addition of that kind of a person could provide uh, the uh, Blood Products Advisory Committee with some added uh, expertise, or that it might be a good idea? I loaded it up a little for you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we have always had a consumer representative on the advisory committee as long as I've been familiar with it. Okay. I don't know that there would be anything. Do they vote? That person vote? No. That is a non-voting uh, representative. I don't know that anything would be added by their having the ability to vote because they certainly are free to participate fully in all of the discussions. The votes themselves really aren't the essence of the committee's work, that although on a few issues they do take a vote which is a recommendation to the agency on one thing or another, that really the heart of how the committee functions, I believe, is the opportunity for a public forum and an open discussion with all viewpoints being represented. And I think in that sense, consumers have been represented okay. both on the committee and with the ability to participate. Fine. Uh, I just want to ask you another question about AIDS. Um, has there been, uh, uh, we, we had some statistics before this subcommittee or before one of the subcommittees I sit on that the uh, hemophiliac community, that a, a, an extraordinarily high percentage of that community is now infected with uh, AIDS virus. I've heard 90% of the severe hemophiliacs are infected. 70% of all hemophiliacs uh, are infected. Is, uh, does that statistic seem reasonable to you? I mean, accurate, seem accurate to you? I would have to consult the people that have the numbers. Dr. Epstein tells me it's correct. He's our retrovirologist. Now, with these improved testing procedures on uh, blood, have you seen any drop-off in the incidence of AIDS among uh, people who are uh, hospitalized or for one reason or another receive a transfusion of blood? As compared to when? As compared to the period when uh, we didn't know as much as we know now when, uh, when uh, between the onset of the AIDS epidemic and the time that these, uh, these uh, tests were uh, put in place on the blood supply? Certainly the testing of the blood supply has made it significantly safer. Have you seen any drop-off since the AIDS epidemic began in the number of blood donors. In other words, there was a great fright for a while about blood and AIDS, and uh, people uh, were very reluctant to uh, contribute their blood, donate their blood. Has that period passed over, or is there still a perceptible fall off in the quantity of blood that is today being donated? That, that's not really possible to measure in that we must recruit and process enough to meet the medical needs. 
But well, certainly, can we say that there were so many gallons that were collected in 1982, and so many fewer gallons that were donated in 1991? Or 1990. Well, I think it is true that in 1991 there is actually slightly less blood being used than was used in 1988, for example. But in each case, the systems that are responsible for the blood supply go out and recruit enough donors that they can meet the need. But they, they keep statistics not only on the need but on the quantity of, of blood donated, do they not? But they, they carefully work to make those two parallel, that okay. it is no longer acceptable to collect too much blood and throw it away. You reduce your collections when blood needs go down. Okay. There is a way to preserve uh, donated blood. Is there not a plasma or uh, some way of You can freeze red it? cells for up to 10 years. You can keep frozen plasma for long periods. Has there been a uh, increase in the number of private blood collecting organizations? Now, have people who belong to country clubs or African safari hunters formed little organizations where they very carefully screen the people and they keep the blood within the, quote, family, so called? I believe we are more aware of a few instances of that. I don't know if it's a true increase because prior to the AIDS era, I don't know that anyone paid much attention. We are aware that there are a few organizations that have done that. Do, uh, would they be subject to the jurisdiction of the FDA? Yes. Any blood that's collected in the U.S. must meet the same standard whether or not you're a registered blood bank or a licensed blood bank, private, for-profit, not-for-profit. There is a single set of regulations and recommendations that apply to everyone collecting blood for transfusion. So that uh, a group of people from a small community, it might be, I mentioned country club, safari hunters going to Africa, etc., they would have to come to uh, the way that they operated would be subject to the FDA jurisdiction. Yes. Okay. Have you, uh, but you have no statistics that would indicate that those types of uh, smaller communities getting together and amassing a supply of blood for the future, that, that, that this is a something that's going on, a practice that's growing in America? Well, as I said, I believe we are more aware of that kind of operation than we would have been five years ago or ten years ago, certainly. We have actually licensed some blood banks that are in business primarily for the purpose of collecting blood from an individual to save for that individual or his designated friends and family, and that is something new basically, but they meet the same requirements and our database really doesn't distinguish between who's for profit, not for profit, or other things, so I don't think we could count them okay. readily. Okay, thank you. I see the red light is on. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Dr. Quinnan, I refer to a memorandum signed by you dated March the 20th, 1991. The memorandum was sent to all registered blood establishments, and the subject was deficiencies relating to the manufacture of blood and uh, blood components. It's put here, and I submit it as Exhibit A for the record. Uh, the memorandum refers to problems with blood establishment donor deferral systems, and you write significant deficiencies in donor deferral systems included. Uh, but were not limited to, and I mentioned some of these things, deferral records were incomplete, not current, did not provide for accurate identification of the donor. Donors were not recognized as having multiple reasons for deferral, and computer systems uh, contributed to the loss of donor records or did not uh, recognize uh, deferrals. Dr. Quinnan, how serious are these deficiencies? We regard any deficiency in the, uh, process, the total process of blood collection and qualification to be serious. Um, 
There have been literally thousands of units of blood recalled in the last several years as a result of such deficiencies. And each and every one of those is a serious event. On the other hand, the number of safeguards are in, that are in place are sufficient that, to my knowledge, among all of those recalls, I'm only aware of a single case where it appears that there was a unit of blood that was test positive for HIV that actually got transfused. When a deferred donor gives blood, there's a chance that that donor's blood could be accidentally released. Is, is that not correct? That's correct. Ms. Hoppe, let me ask you this. Uh, when you know that the donor is going to be deferred before you even draw blood, why not just simply tell the donor no? Why should we risk that blood going into the blood supply when there appears to be no benefit in drawing a deferred donor's blood to begin with? I believe the reason that that hasn't been a requirement is in recognition of the system that exists in the U.S. where probably more than 85 percent of our blood is collected on mobile uh, operations that go to a variety of small communities. Certainly in the past those operations have depended heavily on the involvement of volunteers in the processing of donors, registering donors, and it was believed to perhaps jeopardize the confidentiality of people coming to the blood site if one of their neighbors was looking at the donor deferral list and saying you shouldn't give blood today, I can't register you. I think also the technological problems of bringing uh, computers and things to every site might be a barrier. With all of the new technology, though, it perhaps should be reassessed. Well, where it's practical, you think that, that, is, that we probably should do something uh, in relation to not drawing that blood when we know that it, uh, it's going to be donor-deferred uh, uh, type blood. And in that respect, do you, do you think that could be addressed from, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, or do you think we need to have a statute law uh, to address that? I think certainly it's a question that could be dealt with within the regulatory framework. I think the problems of confidentiality and protecting people's privacy, though, are not insignificant, that one of the barriers to even sharing donor deferral lists with another blood bank that may operate in the same geographic location is people's fear that they're going to end up in a lawsuit because they have violated the donor's privacy. And so I believe that some of those problems need to be, you know, worked through before you could really have an effective system. Well, I, I think what we're talking about here is a blood bank now, and... Uh... Yes, I think, I think a blood bank, and I believe most everyone would agree that it is better practice to not take an unsatisfactory donor into the system if you could avoid it. All right, and so I, I would, again, let me ask the question, can, can that be done by regulation, or should we have some statute law to deal with that? I believe regulations could handle that. Uh, it seems to me it's very practical not to take blood if you're not going to be able to use that blood. Yes, and, I mean, and in fact, in the source plasma industry, we already have a system where the donor's permanent deferral list must be consulted before a donor is registered that day. Okay. That that has not been a requirement in blood collection as it has been in plasma, but the regulations in the plasma industry, I think, have worked very well. Maybe Mary Carden would have some experience with that. Okay, thank you. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Blowley, is recognized. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Bozo, I understand that transfusion centers are currently not required to report accidents or errors that they uncover, such as receiving mismarked blood or blood products from a blood center to the FDA. Do you believe that it would be a good idea to require the transfusion center to report these errors to the FDA? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, actually, there is not a requirement at this time for transfusion services to report directly to FDA, but they have been encouraged, uh, just with some guidance that was issued by FDA last month, to make those reports where, in fact, they deal with errors or accidents that are under their control in operations. They are still encouraged to report back to the initial blood center 
any of those errors or accidents that may have occurred with the blood while it was at that blood center supplying them. By requiring the recipient of mismarked blood or blood products to report to the FDA, uh, it would force blood banks to be more diligent in their reporting lest they get caught by the FDA, wouldn't it? Uh, the broader re reporting requirement, uh, yes. Uh, indeed, it would be additional motivation for the blood banks to comply. Also, more importantly, I think it would be additional motivation for the blood banks to get to the bottom of why those errors occurred in the first place and correct the underlying problem. Would, would such a requirement help to assure the safety of our nation's blood supply, in your opinion? Broader reporting, yes, sir. Would this requirement cause any significant increase in the workload at FDA? Yes, sir, it would. In what way? It would require uh, additional assessments of those reports that come in to the agency to determine exactly how they would be handled. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, it would also require additional follow-ups with respect to those errors and accidents that the agency translated into recall actions. It would also require additional follow-up by field the field organization with respect to investigating the underlying good manufacturing practice problems that existed that were responsible for those errors. Well, are you, would you expect there would be a large number of, uh, of these reports? Yes, sir. Why? I expect there would be an increase in number. It would be an increase in number, but would it be a, a big increase in your opinion? Well, the current requirement, uh, when, when you suggested an expansion of the reporting requirement, I was thinking in broader terms than just transfusion services. I was thinking in terms of the unlicensed blood establishments that are operating within each state. In addition, because the current regulation for reporting errors and accidents covers those licensed facilities throughout the U.S. But if we are, if the goal, and I'm, I'm certain it is the goal of the FDA, it as well as it is to the Red Cross and to this Congress, is a, a safe blood supply, and you have already testified that uh, this would increase, in your opinion, the safety of our blood supply, uh, then uh, uh, we shouldn't, in my opinion, uh, be overly concerned that it might involve some more work. Well, I was responding to your question, sir, about uh, would, it, would it require increased resources, and I believe it would. Could the FDA order this by rule, or would a statutory change be required? I believe it could be accomplished by rulemaking, and it's our intent to pursue that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman from Oregon. Last uh, question about uh, the Portland situation, uh, Ms. Cardin, and, and then I uh, want to turn to some other areas and pick up on this point Dr. Uh, Rowland uh, made with respect to you know the donor uh, deferrals and the problem that you found uh, in Portland uh, as well. What you see throughout your report uh, on Portland is that uh, you cite that in many instances uh, uh, unsuitable blood uh, has been uh, been released, and you document it in 37, 38. It really goes on in a number of areas. Now, the Red Cross says that absolutely none has been transfused uh, into uh, anyone. And my question is, given your uh, findings with respect to their problems in testing and in record keeping and the lack of the social security numbers and 594 uh, deferred uh, donors. Is the Portland Red Cross in a position to make that claim? I'm sorry, which claim are you referring to? You're saying that none has been transfused in anyone. We, your, your report talks about blood being unsuitably, uh, unsuitable blood having been uh, released. And what we have been told over the last couple of days uh, is that uh, uh, none of this has been transfused into uh, any uh, individual. My question is, given the problems that you found with testing there, given the problems you found with record keeping there, such as the 594 uh, donors, uh, deferred donors, where there's no social security number, is the Portland Red Cross in a position to make that claim? 
I don't believe so, because in addition to the problems that we identify, I think what the report indicates is the fact that there are others that we don't know about. Okay. Thank you. And again, I, I want to uh, tell you how much I, I personally appreciate your having been the one to, to do the work uh, in Portland because um, folks uh, are concerned. I've been trying to make it very clear that I think people who need transfusions uh, in Oregon ought to have them, period, because uh, if you need one uh, to sustain life, that's, uh, that's uh, the key uh, decision. But I think it's also important that when people of your experience uh, and background uh, make these kinds of reports that people uh, have access uh, to what's, uh, what's in them and an opportunity to uh, think through the implications. And I particularly appreciate your uh, clarifying uh, some of these points today and thank you for your work. Okay. Uh, let me turn to some other areas, uh, uh, if I might, uh, for you. Uh, uh, Mr. Vince, uh, I know you uh, recently were down uh, in the Dallas uh, area. Uh, is that correct, until recently? I have been serving as the Dallas District Director, yes, sir. With respect to some of the blood banking operations uh, that you saw uh, down in Odessa, uh, Texas, I think it'd be helpful if we can learn some of uh, the lessons that uh, uh, you picked uh, up down there. In October of 1989, the Director of uh, Pathology at uh, a medical center uh, hospital informed you that the blood bank had identified a serious problem with its permanent donor uh, deferral list and I gather they asked for assistance from uh, your office down there, the regional FDA office. That's correct. Uh, Dr. Bagnall, the director of pathology at that uh, facility called me on October the 25th and the hospital also voluntarily ceased blood banking uh, operations because of these problems? They had already ceased the uh, blood banking uh, portions of their, their operations on that date. About a week earlier, they had ceased drawing regular donors, and although they continued their autologous donors for about another week, they eventually discontinued that. They did continue their transfusion services, but they utilized blood products from an outside source and with other laboratory testing other than their own facility. F FDA inspectors went to the medical center hospital a number of, uh, of times. What did they find with the problems of donor deferral? Uh, as follow-up to the information from the hospital that they had experienced problems, we conducted uh, subsequent visits to assess their own audit and their reevaluation of the problem. Uh, it appeared that the system in place was insufficient or ineffective in adding or properly listing donors to the deferral list who had either tested positive for HIV or hepatitis. Did you find uh, other uh, problems, good manufacturing practices problems and record keeping and lab practices, that sort of thing? Uh, the problems at the facility were across the board. There were other problems, as you mentioned, with how procedurals many, and testing How techniques. many units of blood or components uh, were released for transfusion or further manufacture that shouldn't have been released? Uh, on that uh, area? Our review of the audit that was performed by the hospital at, at our request, of course, uh, indicated that there were approximately 57 units which had either unacceptable test results or had been uh, collected from donors who should have been properly deferred from that uh, donation. Yeah, be happy to. This is just the point that we were talking about earlier, about blood being drawn from people who were on a donor deferral system that we're talking about in a hospital here, yes, this would not have happened uh, had uh, these people not given that blood in the first place. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. But on the other hand, it, the problem at this particular facility appeared to be the failure of the medical center hospital to properly list or to include these individuals in their deferral list. I understand that. But was blood also drawn from people who were on that deferral list? It was they were aware that they were on that deferral list. There may have been some instances of that, yes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, just a couple of other questions, and uh, uh, and this member is almost done, and I know you all have uh, had a long day. Uh, on, this, uh, on this situation in Texas, how many of the collections were from donors with a history of unacceptable HIV or hepatitis test uh, results? 
the HIV uh, background or indication, I believe there are 23 units. Uh, there were, based on the additional review of the data, there were 24 units that had indicated unacceptable hepatitis test results that were drawn by the facility. Does, uh, does this mean that HIV or hepatitis positive units were transfused into unsuspecting patients? No, sir, it doesn't. Uh, as best we could determine, uh, there are no units that actually tested positive that were transfused to a, a patient. Okay. One, one last uh, question for you, um, Ms. Cardin, if I might, with respect to the voluntary uh, agreement. And I asked you earlier whether you felt that the Red Cross was in compliance with the voluntary agreement. You said that you felt they were not. I wanted to ask you about a couple of specific kind of examples that you may have discovered over uh, the last uh, year. Have you found in, in the last year that there was failure uh, to defer donors that tested positive to hepatitis uh, B, resulting in erroneous uh, release of blood components? Are you referring to a particular center or? Yeah, I, I, my understanding was, as we talked about the voluntary uh, agreement, that you had found a number of uh, violations of uh, the agreement, and I wanted to ask about a couple of specific categories. Did this happen at one or more centers where there was a failure to uh, defer a donor that tested positive for hepatitis B and that resulted in the erroneous release of a blood component? The deferral system failed to catch them the next time, yes. Okay. Was there in one or more of, uh, of the uh, centers a failure to report uh, errors to, to the Red Cross uh, headquarters or the FDA? Yes. Was there a failure of uh, the Red Cross audit team to uncover uh, these kinds of problems? As best we could assess. And there was a failure to check accuracy of computer data uh, files as well? Yes. So in these four areas, at one or more of the centers, these would be examples of violations of the voluntary agreement that was entered into between the federal government and the Red Cross in September of 88. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me, uh, let, me, let me make a point here, if I may. So that if, a, if the blood bank had not turned themselves in, uh, this situation could have gone on for years. Is that correct? And if In the case of the medical center hospital, it's, it is possible, sir. Uh, as I understand it, to find absence of names on the deferred donor file, the FDA inspector would have to uh, been very lucky or done a 100% uh, record audit. Is that a fair statement? I reasonably so, it is. But 100 percent order of the records would uh, take an enormous amount of time. Did the Dallas region have enough resources to perform such inspections? Uh, the Dallas district has a, a limited number of resources. We can always use more to focus those on our priority programs, and certainly additional staff would give us a greater latitude to uh, spend more time and, and expend more critical looks at these industries. Sir. How many blood establishments are there in the Dallas region? Uh, district, I mean. Three states that encompass Dallas District, Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas have approximately 230 blood banks and plasma centers. And how many inspectors are available to check those establishments? We currently have 51 or 52 consumer safety officers or investigators. And how many more inspectors does the region need to do a really thorough job of inspection? That's a very difficult question to answer, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we can always use more resources, but certainly, uh, as you heard earlier today, the industry that we're discussing here is a very technical one. Uh, it takes a good deal of expertise and training to become capable to conduct these type of inspections. So, it Well, based on your experience in the field, would you favor a regulation requiring all registered blood establishments to report accidents and efforts to the Error. F errors to the uh, FDA? It would facilitate our discovery or our our indication of a problem at that facility, yes. This is, we, we have a voluntary system now. Should we have a mandatory requirement? I'm sorry. You just voluntary. We have a voluntary system of direct cost. Should we have a some, mandatory requirement? In some requirement? cases, it's voluntary. In certain instances, it is, in fact, mandatory. Should it be mandatory in all instances? I believe it would have some practical value, yes. 
Uh, accident error reports are sent to FDA headquarters. Do you think that it would be helpful for FDA field personnel if blood banks were required to send copies of these reports to the nearest field office? It would assist us in scheduling our inspections and coordinating the investigation or follow-up on those. Uh, there is a very small delay when the, by the time the sender receives them, but in the case of 230 establishments, the uh, travel schedule and the uh, planning of these investigations could certainly be more efficient if there was quicker notification. Thank you, Mr. Vance. Uh, Mr. Blyne? Just a few questions, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Hoppe, I would like to ask you some questions relating to what is generally referred to as uh, look back. There are several variations of look back, but they all involve going back through hospital and or blood bank records to attempt to locate patients who may have received a transfusion that was contaminated with an infectious agent such as HIV or hepatitis. Is that a fair summary? Would you repeat that? There are several variations of look back, but they all involve going back through hospital and or blood bank records to attempt to locate patients who may have received a transfusion that was contaminated with an infectious agent such as HIV or hepatitis. Is that a fair summary? Yes. One typical example is a blood recipient who contracts AIDS a number of years after receiving a transfusion. An investigation must be conducted to determine whether the transfusion was the cause of the AIDS. If so, further investigation would be required to determine if the HIV positive blood donor had donated blood to any other persons, and efforts would be undertaken to locate these persons. Such efforts are time and resource consuming and have generally not been all that successful in locating persons who may be at risk. Isn't that correct? That's correct. An alternative to current look-back procedures has been proposed by a blood establishment in Oklahoma, and I believe you're familiar with the concept. Is that right? I'm familiar with a proposal made by Dr. Simon of uh, Albuquerque. Yeah, this is a proposal uh, that would automatically test all recipients of transfusions at a given time after the tra transfusion, such as six months to determine if antibodies to the disease such as HIV or hepatitis have developed. Do you think this might be a more effective and timely uh, test than current look-back procedures? I think that's a very complex issue. My own opinion is that it has some attractiveness because it's simple and complete, but it involves an enormous resource use of health care dollars in looking for a needle in a haystack, essentially, when you are going to test all the people who have received tested blood to pick up those few cases where the test either wasn't done properly or the test wasn't 100 percent effective. So I think that it would take uh, a very careful, complete study to decide. There happens to be a study funded by NHLBI currently underway which will provide data on this question and I would think that looking at the outcome of that study might be useful in making that sort of a public health decision which really goes beyond the area of the FDA. It's well, two questions come to mind. First, when, could you send uh, that study to us when it's completed? I'm sure that they would be glad to provide it. It's an NHLBI funded study there have been some publications already out of that study, and I'm sure that uh, we the can second. provide that now. Could I clarify something I said earlier because sure. it's been pointed out that I may have misled you? Your first question, I believe, included both HIV and hepatitis. Right. There is not a routine look back on hepatitis B in the same way that we do HIV look back. That certainly post-transfusion hepatitis B is followed up but there are not quite the same sort of systems for routine look back when a donor serial converts, just so the record's clear. What, what does it cost to do uh, a test? Uh, say I had a transfusion and then it's six months later I go back for a test. What, what is the approximate cost uh, for a test? 
If you go to your physician, I have been told within the last week that something like an HCV test may cost you $100. Now, if that same test is done in a blood center, it probably only costs $5. But the cost billed to patients would not be insignificant. And there, you know, as but you know, there are But if you went to the blood bank, it would only be $5. I believe that a single test can be done for about $5, but you have many agents you might want to test for. Dr. Quinnan, would you follow up on this to set up a study of this post-transfusing testing uh, to determine if it has any real promise? The agency will certainly follow up on it to uh, determine if there is any promise. Um, I believe Mrs. Hoppe is correct that the NIH NHLBI study that's ongoing will provide an important database in that regard. Have you any idea when that study will be complete? We'll get you information about that study, sir. Sure, and, and we really would like to have your evaluation of that study once you've gotten in and once you've had a chance to look at it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any further questions. Gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, and uh, just one uh, small matter. Uh, uh, Dr. Quinn, and given the seriousness of the situation in, in Portland, I'd like to ask you to keep me personally abreast of uh, any developments you have on the Portland uh, uh, situation and any information that I could, uh, I could have uh, that I could pass on to my, my constituents at home. Is that acceptable to you? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all of you uh, this morning. I want to thank you for the good job that you do. You work hard under very difficult circumstances, short-handed. We realize that, and we appreciate what you do very much. And I uh, also want you to know that we appreciate you being here uh, this morning for this, uh, this hearing and the testimony that you've given. The record will be held open for additional written questions. We stand adjourned. That concludes Thursday morning's hearing, and a note that Politics 91 this weekend will feature remarks by Democratic Senator Bill Bradley of New Jersey. He was the guest last week before the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Again, we'll air his speech focusing on the agenda of the Democratic Party, Sunday on Politics 91, at 12.30 p.m. and again at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll take a break now for a look at the schedule. You're watching C-SPAN, and we're taking a break now for information about our overnight schedule. First, a note that Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary